Good morning, everybody. I'm hoping uh, my voice is loud and clear. My name is Peter Coveney. I'm from University College London. I'm going to be uh, welcoming you to the second day of the meeting and chairing the first session. First of all, I would like to welcome you and hope that you are returning from the first day, which was pretty informative and exciting, even in this rather constrained format of online muted uh, conference style. We um, have a few announcements that are worth making. Some people may be familiar if they were here yesterday, of course, others may be joining. And uh, two things that I want to mention, point out. One is that there is uh, a YouTube link and you can access that by clicking on uh, the interface to the Zoom, or if you go in the chat function, you'll see a link there which you can connect to. This is a live streaming of the uh, presentations, but uh, it's a, a second question as to whether these talks are all recorded for afterwards. They are being through YouTube, other than those individuals who've asked for us not to retain them in that form. And, and that will become available after the meeting. There is a, a Q&A question and answer function that you should avail yourself of if you want to ask questions uh, to the speakers after they've spoken, or at least after their videos, pre, in most cases, have been presented. The speakers are here to answer your questions. So do you use that? Uh, in role as the chair and other chairs, we'll look at the questions and try to um, address those to the speakers. So I think at, at this point, we can start to move into the session itself. I want to just mention that uh, the people organizing the, the, the meeting have been able to draw on these uh, SIAM and ICCS uh, mini symposia and sessions and are delighted that we've got so many people wanting to speak at, at the event today. Vecna is a, an EU project that's central objective is to develop a software toolkit for uh, verification, validation and un uncertainty quantification. And uh, the session that's upcoming now is um, re really revolving around uh, the work of the Vecna project and um, effectively today, the 12th of June, is the second annual release of what we call the Vecna Toolkit, which is an open source and open development project. And uh, the first speaker in, the morning, in, in this morning's session is Derek Krong from uh, Brunel University. And his presentation, which is being loaded up now for us, is uh, about the Vecna toolkit and effectively also announcing the uh, release of the toolkit. So I think with that, I have the pleasure of handing over to start this video. Let's go with that. Hello, my name is Dirk Groen and today I present about the Vecma Toolkit, a verification, validation and uncertainty quantification toolkit for multi-scale and HPC simulations. And this toolkit is the main deliverable for the Vecma project and there are a lot of people that contributed to the project. Um, for instance, Hamid, uh, Rabnajad, uh, Vitas Jankauskas, Wouter Edeling, uh, Jalal Akili and, and Bartos Bosak, just to name a few. Um, the VECMA project stands for Verified Exascale Computing for Multiscale Applications. Uh, it's a Horizon 2020 uh, EU project, and its main aim is to establish a toolkit, basically the VECMA toolkit for verification, validation, and uncertainty quantification, as well as sensitivity analysis for uh, multiscale applications that require large scale supercomputers. Um, the project uh, will last for one more year until June uh, 2021. And basically, the release date of the VECMA toolkit is today, and there will be an updated uh, release six months from now. 
Uh, the Vecma Toolkit um, has uh, six different components, and the idea is that rather than providing a monolithic framework, um, users are able to download, use, and combine these toolkits as they see fit. Uh, each of them has a um, as a simple slogan, uh, so I'll go over all six of them. Um, so the first tool, Easy View Q, is basically for people who need error bars. Uh, Muscle 3 is for people who want to couple codes and propagate uncertainty through the coupling. Uh, FabSim 3 is uh, for people who want to run complicated workflows, do complicated things, but don't want to go through all the tedium of man managing everything manually. Um, so it's an automation toolkit. Uh, QCG client and broker are um, for managing different job types on the remote machine specifically, and that also includes uh, workflows that have been automated. QCG pilot job um, is for people who need to run more jobs, uh, for example, 1,000, 10,000, 100,000, perhaps one day 100 million. And QCG now is for users who want to use an HPC machine now. Um, the toolkit has been under development for uh, two years and there have been six public releases. Uh, the, the, the main releases are uh, the initial release, Mass 12, and the Mass 24 release that we are doing today. Um, a lot of things have been improved uh, over all these months. Uh, performance, deployment, stability has improved, but there's also far, far more documentation and tutorials. Um, within VECMA, um, there are seven uh, applications. These include fusion, materials, migration, urban air pollution, human arteries, uh, climate, and earthquake. Uh, in the case of urban air pollution and earthquake, these are actually external applications. And there's also an eighth application that emerged very recently, which is about the modeling of COVID-19 spread. Um, the release that I'm presenting today is the Month 24 release, and it's uh, labeled as the preliminary deep track version of the VECMA toolkit. So what does that mean? Well. First of all, the scalability of the toolkit has been improved a lot compared to previous releases, uh, especially the Mass 12 release. Um, and there are also a lot of new developments on each component that I'll go through uh, quickly in this presentation. Um, there's also integrations of uh, uncertainty quantification patterns and verification and validation patterns in a range of different tools. And uh, we also updated the documentation and added a lot of new tutorials actually about various things. Um, some of the applications have an interactive tutorial already, but others uh, will get interactive tutorials uh, over the next two months as we plan to finalize the documentation in August. So if you have any suggestions to improve the documentation, please uh, raise a GitHub issue or send us an email. Um, another change is that we have uh, some software to facilitate COVID-19 applications. Uh, most notably at the moment, we have a FabSim 3 plugin for the flu and coronavirus simulator, uh, which people can use to basically uh, create and run um, ensembles of models, um, modeling individual regions, for example, in London, and to see how COVID-19 spreads. Uh, there's also a generic plugin for uh, COVID-19 simulator sensitivity underway, and we hope to uh, release that in the near future. Um, to showcase that we don't provide a monolithic tool, uh, but rather modular components that people can pick and choose, uh, we tend to present our toolkit using a tube map, which you can see here. Uh, in this tube map, uh, every box is essentially a component. Um, so for example, um, in the top left, you can see QCG now uh, here. Um, and all these components can be connected together. And what you can see is uh, lines in different colors, and each of these lines um, constitutes an example application. And um, the idea is based that every application uses some of the tools, but very few of the applications use all of the tools. Uh, and that basically results in lines connecting the applications and the user with the different tools. So uh, for instance, uh, materials would use EasyVMUQ and FabSim3, uh, but perhaps not uh, the other tools in this particular example. Uh, while for example, uh, Fusion would also use EasyVMUQ, but not on the local resource, but rather on the remote supercomputer and would combine this with QCG pilot job uh, and QCG clients to, uh, to run this effectively. Um, the aims of the VECMA toolkit are on the right side. Um, so yeah, basically um, there are four main aims, but the fifth one is perhaps the most important one is that the toolkit is actually used by the scientific community. Okay, I'll go very briefly through all the components. Um, so first of all, there's easy VVUQ. Um, so VVUQ, of course, stands for verification, validation, and uncertainty quantification. And easy VVUQ is a library for creating application-specific UQ procedures that are called campaigns. Um, it creates uh, samples. So the idea is that you have all sorts of simulations with slightly different input parameters. Um, and it creates those samples, but it can encode, so convert them to input files that can actually be run on the remote supercomputer. 
Um, and then it can also decode, so it can take output of simulations and then translate it back to the internal system of analyzing and doing UQ. Uh, it also has a range of routines to perform this analysis. Uh, but what is very important here is that EasyView VUQ doesn't facilitate the execution itself. <clears throat> Although uh, EasyView VUQ allows you to run ensembles on the local host, um, it's actually much more common to run all these ensembles, as they're called, uh, using Fabsyn3, uh, QCD pilot job, uh, or other tools. Um, EasyView VUQ uh, supports very large sample sizes and has a very limited overhead because there have been a lot of improvements um, for instance, the adoption of a centralized uh, database. Uh, and the number of samples can be quite large. Uh, we've even uh, ran ensembles with 10,000s of samples, for instance. Uh, EasyVVQ also uh, supports iterative samples, so you don't have to run or schedule all the samples in one go, but you can do this iteratively. And you could also have multiple rounds of uh, sensitivity analysis, for example, or uh, uncertainty quantification. The second component uh, that I want to reflect on is FabSim3. Uh, FabSim3 is a generic automation and curation toolkit uh, for complex scientific workflows, uh, but also multi-scale computing in specific. Um, it supports a range of backends, so uh, you can run FabSim jobs on your local host, on a range of uh, remote supercomputers that are already configured, uh, and you can also use tools like QCG Broker and uh, Pilot Jobs to effectively run uh, large ensembles, for instance. The way FabSim works is that it's not meant to be entirely user-friendly, but it's sort of user-developer friendly. So the idea is that it's very easy to modify things and to adjust your workflow to fit a new situation. And to do that, it uh, facilitates a lot of bash one-liners that you can type in terminal. So for example, you can say, uh, FabSim, Eagle, uh, Eagle standard supercomputer validates flea, and then uh, Mali is the configuration. You want to use 24 cores and five replicas. And you can just type that and, and quickly do a validation of the flea code. Um, FabSim3 supports a lot of different plugins. Um, these include uh, FabDummy, uh, FabMD, which is on materials, FabFlea, which is on migration, FabCovid19, which is self-explanatory, FabMogP, which is about earthquake simulations, a FabUQ campaign, which is climate related, and then uh, three plugins that are in earlier uh, stages of development, which are FabMuscle, FabProfile, uh, FabProfile is for uh, profiling of codes, and FabSMD, uh, which is uh, molecular dynamics related. Um, another component in the VECMA toolkit is QCG Pilot Job, uh, which is a lightweight and flexible pilot job mechanism, and it allows you to schedule and execute a lot of tasks inside one scheduling system allocation on the supercomputer. It can be used uh, through two types of interfaces. You can either provide it a, a file with all the settings, or you can use the network and actually dynamically um, yeah, control um, your, your pilot job. Um, jobs can be easily run on local computers, but QCD pilot job is particularly useful on HPC resources because that's much harder to run a large number of small jobs. Um, there's also uh, an integration um, that is already working with EasyVVQ library that basically allows you to do very effective sampling, encoding and decoding on the remote supercomputer together with QCG pilot job. QCG now is another tool and uh, this tool is quite different to the other tools in the sense that it's very optimized for the user experience, not so much for the developer experience. Um, it's a desktop tool that allows you to submit jobs uh, to computing resources that are connected to the QCG middleware and you can install it on Windows, Linux or uh, Mac OS. And it supports, uh, for instance, data transfer. And more recently, it has a lot of improvements in the area of application monitoring. Um, you can also use command line uh, submission. Uh, and there are also job templates in the graphical interface to make it easier for you to configure your jobs. And um, you can see at the bottom how you can access it. Uh, then there are two other tools um, that I discussed just briefly. Uh, first of all, this QCD client, which we use in VECMA, uh, but is not so directly exposed to the users. Um, the idea is basically to offer a single point of access to many heterogeneous HPC resources, <clears throat> and also to support interactive tasks and uh, to attach it to running jobs. And Muscle 3, I keep short because, of course, there's an extensive talk by Laudan Spain yesterday, uh, where he presented the toolkit in a variety of examples. Uh, but just as a recap, uh, the aim of Muscle 3 is uh, to make creating coupled multi-skill simulations easy and to then enable efficient uncertainty quantification of such models, uh, for example, using advanced semi-intrusive algorithms. Uh, the development of Muscle 3 is uh, not mainly funded through VECMA, but actually through the eMusk project. But uh, through a collaboration between these two projects, uh, Muscle 3 is actually full part of uh, the VECMA toolkit. Now, the next part, uh, I want to touch a little bit on the performance aspects. Um, 
So basically, one of the things that we use the Vecma Toolkit a lot for is to run ensembles, uh, for example, to quantify uncertainty or uh, analyze sensitivity. Within the Vecma Toolkit, we have three different approaches to do that. Um, you can use uh, FabSim3 and basically have one liners to run entire ensembles and configure them. Um, that is very uh, usable unless you really want to have a GUI uh, experience, but on the command line, I think it's about as easy as it gets. Um, it also stages files for you remotely and you don't have to uh, deploy any middleware uh, on the remote resource. So that's also very convenient. Um, but in terms of performance, that option, although the most convenient, is also uh, the slowest. So uh, for example, to submit uh, 100 jobs, you would spend about 40 to 90 seconds of uh, overhead and submit, submit 1,000 or more jobs is actually not so uh, efficient because um, you have to put these jobs in a supercomputer scheduler and a normal supercomputer scheduler uh, doesn't quite support that number of jobs at the same time at least not on most resources. The second option you can do is uh, use FabSim3 combined with QCD pilot job. Uh, this has the slight drawback that you have to deploy QCD pilot job on the remote resource. But the upside there is that uh, QCGPJ is actually uh, a framework that you can install as a user. So you don't need to approach the administrator to install it. And it has already been uh, deployed um, quite extensively on machines with the Slurm scheduler. Uh, when you do that, um, the submission over at 100 jobs uh, drops um, to about 33 to 36 seconds, uh, mainly because the submission of the jobs is, uh, is nearly instant. And you can also start running larger number of jobs because all your jobs will be packed into this pilot job container. So it's much easier to actually schedule 1,000 or even 10,000 jobs. Uh, in the case of 1,000 jobs, uh, you'll be spending about 250 to 300 seconds submission overhead, and a lot of that is actually in the FabSim layer because you're staging in these, uh, these files. Lastly, what you can also do, and this is performance-wise the best option, is to actually log into the remote supercomputer and just use QCD pilot job uh, directly. <clears throat> this is a little bit less usable because all the data transfer and organization of the files is not uh, organized for you automatically, um, but still it's about as usable as normally submitting jobs on the remote supercomputer uh, by hand. Um, yeah, so it also doesn't support remote file stage, and you also have to install QCD pilot job. But in terms of performance, you get an enormous benefit, and you can submit a thousand jobs in uh, 40 seconds or less. In terms of performance results, I just wanted to quickly show uh, these plots. Um, essentially, in FabSim3, for instance, we did a huge optimization, and the overhead um, in job submission has dropped considerably. In MAS12, we were talking about 10 seconds per job, and in MAS24, if you use uh, six threads on the local host, you can uh, be as fast as uh, 0.38 seconds per job. Uh, if you have QCD pilot job start on the supercomputer, uh, you're looking at overheads of 0.05 seconds per job. Uh, but of course, you have to be logged into the local supercomputer. Um, one of the things that we are starting to introduce in the Vecma Toolkit are patterns. And uh, we started that by actually having generic pieces of codes uh, around the verification and validation patterns. Uh, we have four such patterns proposed, and two of them are implemented and provided in this version of the toolkit. Um, the first one is ensemble output validation, where you can validate across uh, an ensemble of different validation settings. And the second one is about uh, validation by comparing quantity of interest distributions, where you can see a few uh, examples in the bottom right. Due to time constraints, I won't go into detail, but here are the links to the two tutorials if you want to give that a try. In terms of application tutorials, um, in the MAS12 release, we already offered migration, fusion, climate, and materials tutorials. Uh, all these tutorials have been updated, um, so you can make use of the latest features of the toolkit. But we also added two additional tutorials, uh, which is uh, one about COVID-19 modeling using the Flume Coronavirus Simulator, and the other one is uh, Earth earthquake modeling, uh, which is in collaboration with Eric Daub from the Turing Institute and uses uh, the Mock P emulator. Gaussian process emulator, to be precise. Uh, the tutorials can be found on vecmatoolkit.eu slash tutorials, and information about the toolkit as a whole is on the website there. So to conclude, the toolkit is now released. Uh, feel free to give it a try and let us know how we can improve it and support you in using it. Thank you very much. Great. Well, Derek, uh, thank you very much for that. It didn't go unobserved that you were sporting the world's only Vecma T-shirt. And I'm already very jealous of you, and I've been trying to find out how I can get one. We've got a couple of questions for you. 
and I hope you can hear clearly, one from Anton Lebedev who asks, does Easy BBUQ ensure that the number of runs of a simulation is minimal to achieve the necessary error bars? He doesn't want uh, to be doing lots of trivial statistics unnecessarily having run loads of simulations. Uh, all right, well, um, th yeah, thanks a lot for the question. Um, I, I hope I'm well audible. Uh, please let me know if it's not the case. Um, so in the case of... E we heard very clearly, yes. Very okay, clear. very good. Um, so yeah, in the case of ECVVUQ, uh, how many simulations you run depends a little bit on the kind of uh, sampling technique that you choose to use. Um, so for example, uh, if, if you were to use stochastic co-location, you can... Um, specify the polynomial order and the number of simulations you would then have to run depends uh, both on the amount of number of parameters as well as the polynomial order. So if you set that very high, then yes, you could be running uh, too many simulations. Um, but there are also other techniques within ECVVUQ available that do more adaptive and dynamic sampling. And this is particularly useful when the number of parameters is, is rather large. And in those cases, um, the, the sampling algorithms themselves um, ensure that um, basically, especially the parameters that are more sensitive get a, a more broad range of sampling. So if you use some of these adaptive techniques, um, then basically you are preventing yourself from uh, needlessly running too many simulations. Thank you for that. And just quickly, may I interject, say when you talk about a large number of parameters, can you give us some idea of what it means to be large or small here? Um, yeah, I think with stochastic co-location in our experience, it works um, in most cases if you have say up to perhaps five or, or seven parameters. Um, I think in those regimes, if you have a polynomial order of two or three, you'll get into the thousands of runs. Uh, and beyond that, it just gets it gets very expensive. If you use these adaptive methods, um, at least what we've tried in practice, it seems that uh, we're able to, for example, analyze the sensitivity uh, of about uh, 20 parameters without too much difficulty. Thank you. Now we have another question, and this one's coming from Philip Maybank, and he poses you the following question. A toolkit be used to run jobs on cloud services such as AWS or Microsoft Azure? Um, to, to a certain extent, that is possible, um, and it depends a little bit on the, on the individual tools. Um, so EasyVVUQ, which does a lot of the sampling, encoding, and decoding, can be run. Uh, yeah. Either you can run it locally, generate everything, and then submit the jobs on Azure. Um, and I think it's also possible to actually run it on Azure uh, or on AWS if you would want to. Um, the area where uh, the portability is not complete yet is basically FAPSIM 3. Um, so submitting FAPSIM 3 jobs to Azure is uh, a little bit tricky because we need SSH access, uh, direct SSH access to Azure. So there are some constraints. Uh, but my understanding is that it is possible to get it working with the latest version of um, of, of the Windows environment, uh, but not necessarily with all the versions. Uh, in terms of AWS, um, to my knowledge, we haven't tried that recently. Hi, everyone. Uh, so I can't, I can't, I, oh, okay. Um, so I can't guarantee that, uh, that that works out of the box. Um, that being said, um, this is uh, one of the priorities that we want to look into uh, in the coming year to see if we can uh, get these things also interoperable with the cloud. Because especially in the case where you have a relatively uh, cheap model and you want to run a large number of them, of course, clouds uh, provide a good platform. Good. Thank you very much, Derek. Uh, with that, I think we can... Uh, move to the next presentation. So I'm hoping we'll load that up here. And uh, let's see if we can get it on the screen. This uh, talk is coming from Jalal Lahlili, who uh, as a member of the Vecna project is based at the Max Planck Institute for Plasma Physics in Garching in Germany, and their applications are in the area of fusion plasma simulations. Uh, let's run the talk now. My name is Jalal Lili. I'm from Max Planck Institute for Plasma Physics, Garching, Germany. Today we'll talk about our work in VECMA project and it's about uncertainty quantification for multiscale fusion plasma simulations with VECMA toolkit. First, let's start with the context 
of the project. Our application work is plasma fusion, and the plasma is an ionized gas. You can find it in solar wind, lightning. So where the fusion phenomena is produced. And the fusion is potentially a solution for a safe and clean energy without carbon emission. But the models describing the fusion plasma uh, are generally characterized by complex and a highly emotional system. So the medical simulations has always played a crucial role in this research area. And currently the plasma physics is taking a step from interpretive to predictive simulation. So performing VVQ is a very important step in this research area and the is very it's a very important project. And here I will just show you some applications and and how we are doing the, the uh, UQ uh, with the VIGMA toolkit. I will follow this outlook. So first I will talk about the fusion workflow. Second, I will talk about UQ propagation. So I will give an overview about, about methods and patterns that we are using. And then I will give some applications and the results for each pattern. And in the end, I will give a small conclusion. Here is a large picture of the fusion application where we are capping micro and macro models. It's concerning a 3D transport code plus 1D transport and 2D geometry code. We have uncertainties inputs in external sources as well as in turbulence codes. It's until there are internal uncertainties. So we need to quantify the propagation of those uncertainties through this workflow. And also we need to do some validation of the of the output simulations against experimental data. But here in this in this presentation, I will just focus on the uncertainty propagation. We are using the matrix as I said, and it fits uh, well in uh, in the in the tube map. This map tube are shown here in our application is high performance computing application. So UQ, with UQ we need to, to, to do a lot of samples, so run a lot of jobs, and thanks to QCG per job that we can do it in parallel and in HPC resource, resources. We're using also ZVQ, the second the more important library for us in, the, in this, in this uh, toolkit to, to do uh, sampling, uh, <coughs> statistics, and uh, since we this, the so whole thing about UQ, we can do it also in in local, but we are doing generally this uh, per the, the this workflow performing it in clusters. Now we will talk about the uncertainty propagation. So in the library is VQ, we we have several methods. So mainly we are using quasi Monte Carlo method or stochastic expansions. We have two variants, polymer chaos or stochastic collocation, and depend of the user, the number, for example, of the parameters. So user can choose either one or another method. The pattern that we are using, so we have uh, here, I will just talk about two main patterns that we are using uh, uh, now. So the QP1, just non attributive method. So one black box for the code and you could be is the second pattern is very important in the context of the multi-scale uh, workflow as we have here. So I will present this later, but it's semi intrusive method that we applied to a cyclic multi-scale model. But we will start with this UQP1. So Patterns. So I will just use one application, transport application, where uh, we involve temperature profiles at the macro time scale. Uh, for the UQ method, we are using the primary chaos expansion. I think it's a spectral projection here. And we have uncertainties, as I said, in, in the sources. So it's uh, electron in electron heating sources characterized by Gaussian distribution with three uh, parameters, amplitude, position, and width, 
and the fourth uh, uh, insulatin input is the electron temperature in the age of the plasma and we are interested in, in the electron temperature of uh, as in output of the transport here we have after performing the uq some results so in the left hand side the statistics some descriptive so we as we see though the most <coughs> uncertainty that we have are in the core of the plasma where it's also the uh, coordinate uh, toroidal coordinate equal zero but in the age of the plasma where rotor equal one we have small uncertainty because here just we are we applied uh, where uncertainty just in the uh, electron temperature uh, bundling and we can see it also in the the impact of each uh, parameter in the in the variance of the the electron temperature profile using the sobol first sobol indices as shown in the left right hand side the picture now we move to uh, let's move to the uqp2 application i will add I added to the second uh, code, the equilibrium, where we describe the plasma geometry. We're using the same input and so it is applied previously to transport code, the four, the four parameters. And for the both codes, so we're using one box, so we could be one for each code, with the PCE method for each one. And the output of the workflow, it will be here, the pressure of the plasma. Between the two boxes, we have uh, uh, a new step, two steps. So collecting and sampling here, the, as the temperature electron is the output of the transport code. So we need to, to do approximation of this quantity to produce the um, probability densities. I, we are using the Ken density estimation, KDE here. Uh, it's provided also by EZVQ and it can allow us to build and set the parameters inputs for the equilibrium code. Uh, it's easy to do. It's inside MISVQ, and we are using here multi component objects. It's declaration one component object with two applications one for transport, one for equilibrium. To, to have a new inputs for the, the transport, uh, the, the equilibrium code. So what we did, just approximation of this, of the mean of the temperature electron using spline. And instead of using the, the 100 mm. point, we are really using just here in our case, we chose to use four control points, the spine. So cubic spine and use another uh, <coughs> degree and then it can reduce the number of parameters and also we can build a new distribution for each control point using the control point of the, the, the approximated spine here we can show the densities of each control point so for I think for the first and second one, it's uh, quite similar to uniform one because the, I used for the go, the, the sources the uniform um, distribution and for the the temperature boundary it was I think the um, normal one normal distribution, but we know this uh, the the those distributions are not independent, so we have to perform decoration. It's used in in SVQ by Rosenblatt, Rosenblatt transformation, and then we can use the new the four parameters and new input for the uh, equilibrium code, and then we can have a new results, a new output. Uh, from the equilibrium code 
and here we can see that the propagation uh, of the <coughs> the uncertainties through the second model and uh, in the pressure profile here in the left hand side and the right hand side as expected so we have the super indices of the impact of uh, each uh, parameter here we have four control points and it's um, what we expected because of the the position of the control point uh, uh, regarding the grip we can have impacting the age of the middle of the, the grid of the or uh, or in the beginning so here it's just and prototyping for this UK pattern and the, 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 the main uh, the main thing here is the using spline it's allow us to reduce the number of the the uncertain parameter for the second model uh, and we can use more input parameter for the first one but we can always just keep four or at least five uh, control points and uh, we can run it we can have less samples for the second one so to conclude i present here some uh, two uh, patterns for uh, for uq so the uqp1 is a not resolve it's very easy it can be applied to any models without any need to modify the implementation but in the in the context of multi-scale it's better to use not resolve uh, patterns you could be two it makes uncertainty progression more transparent and also help us to reduce the sample the number of uh, parameters so the number of samples but also we have another variant so because here what i presented it's uh, it's, uh, it's uh, in reality it's you could be two variant a but we can we can have also qp2 variant b we can build the surrogate model for the most expensive single scale model so instead of using the second model uh, uh, second box as the model uh, we can use instead of it the surrogate one and this work is an going work with the incubation with Anna Nikosheva from UV we are doing it for the turbulence code but as you as I show in the beginning the workflow is cyclic so we have another pattern that I didn't talk about today it's the UKP3 so it's the same UKP2 but we cycle and then we can uh, we can see how is propagated how the internal uh, entities are propagated so it's also a ongoing work uh, thank you very much for, for your attention and any question are are welcome thank you very good Jalal and I must say I'm really enjoying chairing this meeting where I know when the, the speaker is going to finish and I don't have to urge them to completion we do have one question now for you Jalal so I hope you're on the line and able to hear me and speak it the question is from Anton Lebedev and it's as follows how did this approach with the UQP1 and UQP2 increase the runtime to the final solution as compared to a reference case when you don't do uncertainty quantification? And when we talk about the runtime, it might mean the amount of, let's say, node hours, core hours, as well as wall clock time considerations. Both are important here. Jalal, can you hear and are you able to? Yes, hello, I can hear you. So, I, it depends how many uh, samples we have, so how many parameters. For example, in the Fusion application, when I have the whole workflow, I, if I, I didn't compare with the, without education, we could just one program. And of course, if we, if we have, for example, four parameters as input, we, can, you, we will have 500 samples so we will run the program 500 times plus the whole uh, sampling part and also analysis part but if we compare in ukp1 and ukp2 with high number yes we reduce 
in at least in my case, I use it by uh, uh, almost half time using UKP1 for both of programs or using UKP2. So UKP1 for one and UKP2 for another one. But I didn't, uh, we, we can't compare the UKP1 and UKP2 versus without as education because we don't have the, the without integration just to one program. Are you saying something clear there about the uh, sort of wall clock time cost of doing this, or can we say it's sort of embarrassingly, pleasingly parallel on a large enough machine? So in terms of wall clock time, it doesn't have any impact. Uh, it's depend because if wall wall time when we are using here, I it just it was prototyping, but when I use pilot job, so Derek was talking about pilot job, so it's in parallel. For example, from uh, 17 hours to uh, half, half, uh, half hour. But right. we're using, for example, a large number of, um, of uh, parameters. Yes. OK. Well, I mean, a, a pilot job was described by Derek earlier, and it's a yeah. concept that may not be totally familiar to people, but it's a way of putting up a reservation effectively onto a large part of a supercomputer and just dropping your jobs. Yeah. into it. Let me um, ask you a question myself. Uh, in terms of um, real world application of this in, in pl fusion plasmas, how would you see this working in practice? I'm thinking, you know, there's this famous uh, project called ITER getting off the ground in Kadarash. Do you expect to be running calculations that could be relevant to final design of that or and or could these methods be used to improve uh, the setup and running when you're trying to get a plasma sustain in a tokamak? Uh, the workflow that we are using here, uh, that, uh, we have uh, the models for turbulence, it's the important one. I think they are one of the, they would call gem. So it's about turbulence in, in tokamak machine and it's in our scope and I, I hope that we will uh, use this method with this turbulence code because it's the expensive one and it's also, it, it produces also the uncertainties. It's a stochastic, out, they have stochastic output. So it's planned and we are doing now some uh, methods with UKP1, UKP2, Gaussian processes with this model. And it's planned for in this Vigma project. And um, where would you be running those simulations? Uh, we have three clusters now, four because we are running in the, in IPP cluster, and also in uh, Eagle and in Marconi. It's in it's in Eurofusion cluster. We have uh, some reservations, so we have three. And now we will use also Supreme Engine. So we have a lot of clusters and lots of hours to burn. Okay, I missed part of that. I don't know if anyone else heard it. Just quickly recapitulate the, the machines. So we have Eagle. So in the in Poland with our colleagues here in Wigma, in the course of Wigma, and uh, Super NG, so in LRZ, the, the another one. So now we I, I have access to it to, to run our code there. And also we have the, for all fusion, we have the Marconi cluster in the Sinica SPC. Right, okay, great. Those are powerful machines for sure. Yeah. Thank you. Thank I think you. At that, uh, with that, we can again thank Jalal Laklili for his presentation and move to the next one. It's my pleasure to introduce um, the talk from Diana Suleimanova, who's at Brunel University with a range of others, and let's uh, run the video now. Good morning or good afternoon. My name is Diana Suleimanova, and I'm a research fellow at Brunel University of London. Today I'm presenting a study conducted in collaboration with Hamid Arabnijad, Walter Dilling and Derek Roy, entitled Sensitivity Driven Simulation Development, a case study in forced migration. 
The content of the presentation as follows. First, I will provide overview of model development in current research. Second, I will introduce sensitivity-driven simulations development to investigate the sensitivity analysis of input parameters in developing more detailed simulations. To showcase our approach, I will explain simulation development approach and flea code for forced migration. Using sensitivity-driven development approach, we performed sensitivity analysis on input parameters in the FLEA algorithm and refined our assumptions around parameters based on results of the first iteration and they performed another set of sensitivity analysis. Finally, I will provide a summary of our study. To start with, in current research, model development is guided largely by four main approaches. First is a top-down design process, which is a planned implementation of natural laws representing an aspect of the physical world. Second is the incremental refinement of existing models by adding in desired aspects that are missing in the original. Third is the availability and incorporation of data sources as inputs or validation targets. And last is the calibration of existing model parameters against data in an attempt to further reduce the forecasting error. Our simulation development process focuses on approximating human behavior and we find ourselves frequently constrained by our limited awareness of natural laws as well as lack of existing models that are both relevant and validated. Also, we have concerns that minimizing the validation error by calibrating existing model parameters against data could lead to overfitting, which we could like to avoid. Overfitting not only reduces the ability of our simulation to be reused in new contexts, but it also makes it highly sensitive to the validation data sources that we work with. We currently rely mostly on incorporating data sources as model input in approach C, uh, and to combine those with the heuristics about human behavior derived from general knowledge and qualitative data. So we propose a sensitivity-driven simulation development approach where we guide this development of simulations using sensitivity analysis. It can be used to further develop and refine existing simulations. So for instance, given an existing simulation, we can apply it using the following four steps. First is that we measure sensitivity of key assumptions in our simulation using existing sensitivity analysis techniques. Using the sensitivity analysis results, we identify which parameters have the largest and possibly even disproportional effect on the validation results. We label these parameters as pivotal parameters, as well as small differences in their value have leveraging effect and uh, leading to much larger and possibly unrealistic change to the results. Third, we refine the underlying model logic that involves the pivotal parameters and manually extend the model and implementation by adding additional rules, making a more detailed breakdown of object types or incorporating derivative parameters. Last, we either consider simulation to be fit for purpose or we go back to the first step and repeat the procedure once more. As you can see, the whole uh, diagram is flowchart shown in the right hand side. As I mentioned, our approach can be used to further develop and refine existing simulations, which is in the case of simulation development approach for forced migration. It consists of six main steps, simulation, situation selection, data collection, model construction, model refinement, simulation execution, and analysis. To start with, we select a country and time period of a specific conflict, which resulted in large scale of forced displacement. Second, we obtain relevant data to the conflict from three data sources. First is the armed conflict location event data project with accurate conflict data. Second is the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, the UNHCR data. And last is the mapping platform such as big maps or the open street maps. We construct our initial model using these data sets and create among other things a network based agent based model. Once we have built the initial model, we refine it as a part of the fourth phase. Here, we manually extract population data to help determine where forcibly displaced people flee from, as well as information on border closures and the forced directions can be implemented. 
The fifth phase involves the main simulation, which we run to predict, given the total number of forced population in the conflict and distribution of displaced people across the individuals across camps can be identified and found. We run our simulations using the fully agent-based code and perform sensitivity analysis on our on input parameters. Once the simulations have completed, the we then analyze and validate the results against the full NHCR for displacement uh, numbers. FLEA is an agent-based simulation code written in Python, which you simulate one day at a time. We place agents in the conflict zones, which are the red dots on the right-hand side network map for Mali. And then we also, each agent decides whether they stay put or move to a neighboring location, such as towns or towards the camps. If they move, which location do they go depends on the chance of to move and the pick specified direction, depending on the network map of the country. There are six main input parameters that we analyzed for sensitivity analysis. Specifically, agents' decisions depend on the following parameters. So move, max move speed, which is the agent's maximum speed in the simulation while traversing between locations with a default value of 200 km per day. Conflict move chance is the probability of agents moving from conflict location with a default value of 1.0. Camp move chance is the probability of agent moving from camp locations with default value of 0.001 and default move chance, which is the probability of agent moving from other locations such as towns, is 0.3. And then we also have uh, conflict weight, which is the attractiveness value for conflict locations, making them four times less likely to be chosen as a destination with the default value of 0.25, and camp weight, which is the attractiveness of a value for camp locations, making them twice as likely to be chosen as a destination hence the default value of 2.0. We perform synthetic analysis uh, using FabFlip plugin, which is a combination of FabSim3 automation toolkit and the FLEA simulation code for forced migration. We then incorporate FabFlip with the EasyVQ toolkit to facilitate verification, validation, and uncertainty quantification for simulation analysis. EasyVQ is a component of VECMA open source toolkit which enables straightforward execution of sensitive analysis on high-performance computing sources. We execute FAFLI runs using QCG pilot job. It's a pilot job mechanism which bypasses constraints of a regular queuing system identified with the scheduling workloads. So to perform sensitive analysis of forced migration, we can construct our models using FAFLI plugin, create an SUVQ script, for sensitive analysis and submit execution runs to QCG pilot job scheduler. To perform sensitive analysis, we use EasyVQ by drawing samples uh, and using stochastic collocation. We extract Sobel indices using Sobel's method. We first defined parameter space for the uncertain variables with the maximum and default values for sensitive analysis, which you can see on the right hand side code script. Next, we provided the range for each parameter and varying ranges using the uniform distribution with polynomial order of three for the sensitive analysis using CurseSpy library within the ECVQ, which you can see on the middle code script. And we performed our sensitive analysis. After submitting our simulations, we obtained results for sensitive analysis for six input parameters across four African conflicts, mainly Mali, Burundi, South Sudan, and Central African Republic. The obtained results identified that default move chance, camp move chance, and the max move speed are the pivotal parameters in our uh, simulations, while the conflict move chance and the camp weight are sensitive parameters. Uh, and the uh, camp uh, conflict weight didn't have any influence on our validation output. We identified that max move speed and default move chances are pivotal parameters. We refine our assumption of flee for these parameters. Precisely max move speed, uh, we incorporate new modes of transport and propose new 
values based on qualitative research we have conducted with NGOs and researchers in the field thanks to International Organization for Migration. Uh, there we found that people t travel on average for 12 hours per day and walk on foot with more move speed of 3 to 4 kilometers per hour and then they initially depart as the roads are likely to be blocked by armed forces and they are unlikely to have secured good shared transportation. We include an additional parameter to this algorithm, main, namely max walk speed with a movement speed of 35 km per day on average during the first travel from the conflict zones. While we change the value for the existing max move speed parameter from 200 km to 420 km per day as use shared vehicles, the next pivotal parameter identified was the default move chance that we modified by changing agent's travel distance. If an agent has traveled a sizable distance, it would benefit from a break. However, if agent has traveled relatively little, it's likely that agent traveling goods uh, supplies and willing to waste excessive time finding safety, we then defined a notion of recent travel distance, which means that when agents set out, they travel at least have the resources to travel conveniently for a day at maximum speed. Once they ha this has occurred, the travel, recent travel distance is greater than or equal to 0.5, while we set the non-exhaustion travel to less than 0.5 and move chance of the location for agents of that movement uh, will remain 1.0. In turn, this in introduces an amendment to the initial rule set of flee. We uh, define parameter space for the additional uncertain variable max wall speed with the minimum, maximum, and default values. And also we redefine the ranges for max move speed and max walk speed in the second iteration, as you can see in the right hand side uh, code script. We performed our uh, synthetic analysis and we obtained some results which we from which we found that camp move chance and the conflict move chance are the pivotal parameters in our simulation in this iteration, while max move speed, default move chance and the camp weight are the sensitive parameters. So we can um, also note that max wall speed and the conflict weight didn't have any uh, influence on the validation output. Uh, while there is a small outlier in the Mali. We calculated the mean for total error for force migration simulations for two iterations across four conflicts. And uh, as you can observe, the total error has decreased in the second iteration as a result of refinements and parameter ranges. Uh, it's also important to note that the four conflicts have different variations of results for sensitivity analysis and the validation results, uh, which is due to differences in simulations. For instance, the simulation periods are different for each single conflict. The network map construction also differs road conditions, how and where agents move in the conflict scenario be, uh, actually plays a big role in these uh, variations. So to summarize, we have presented an example of sensitive driven simulation development, which provides us with a tool to calibrate our algorithm without the direct danger of overfitting to data and its resulting negative consequences in forecasting ability. We have shown that our approach was effective in reducing the relative sensitivity of pivotal parameters while adding detail to the simulations. The most pivotal parameters, uh, which are the default move chance, uh, has the sensitivity has decreased by 74.8%, and the max move speed uh, sensitivity has decreased by 33.4% between the two iterations. Uh, we performed baseline investigation using stochastic collocation approach, but we also plan to perform sensitivity analysis using polynomial cause expansion. Uh, or quasi Monte Carlo to gain perf performance benefits as well as actually reaching a better uh, analysis for synthesis of each parameters. Uh, thank you for your attention and uh, any questions? Yana, thank you. Uh, I trust you're online and you can hear me, is that correct? Hi, yes, I can. 
Great. So uh, as it happens, I don't see any questions there for you. So I'm going to talk to you about your work, which is fascinating and important. I think uh, you're talking about trying to demonstrate what you are capable of at this moment by reference to existing scenarios, which one has to do. Um, the question is, when did, wh wh how can you foresee this thing actually being the system as it were being used in pr practical circumstances as it in the field to deal with uh, human disasters and migrations certainly uh, uh thank you for your question so first of the main uh importance that we have in investigating forced displacement is that we would like to target conflicts uh conflict situations that have forced displacement. And we do hope that in the future, they can actually be useful for NGOs and other organizations or the governments even that are facing forced displacement as well as their neighboring countries. So uh, not only for forced displacement, it can be also used for other situations such as when there is uh, weather uh, changes or uh, that makes our actually people to move. But in terms of sensitivity analysis, I think the main aspect that can be applied is that uh, this approach uh, can be applied to any simulation that has uh, a proper flow of uh, constructing uh, execution as well as analysis in order to understand what kind of input parameters they have applied. Thank you. And there's now a question that's come from Serge Gias, and he's asking you the following. Have you obtained results in terms of propagation of uncertainties through your model? Uh, so far, what we've done, this is the first analysis in terms of sense analysis, understanding how uh, our algorithm has input parameters and how they actually interact with each other, as well as the importance or sensitivities within this, our simulations. So uh, I wouldn't say that we actually obtained in terms of propagation of uncertainty yet, but it's something we would like to investigate further. Okay, now we've got one from Anna Nikishova. This is really boiling up. This is a great example of applying, applying sensitivity analysis for validation. Do you assume, uh, or are you going to assume any noise in the data you use in validation? Uh, certainly, because as in, uh, I mentioned, like each single uh, conflict has different aspects. Uh, when we develop it and there are differences between them, for instance, in constructing them, uh, making the network map and how this uh, conflict actually evolved as the initial, uh, at the stage of the initial um, kind of going on uh, propagation. So uh, we would like to do that as well in terms of the validation because each single parameter has their own differences and uh, we'd like to investigate in more detail how they affect. Thank you. And, and uh, um, I'm going to ask you something now. I'm just thinking that, you know, in terms of what you're doing, where you do retrospective studies on scenarios that have evolved, it strikes me that that's a position where you could find yourself subject to competition from the big data aficionados who might be using sort of more blind methods that don't address the detailed mechanism. Do you have any comments about the merits of, of your approach compared with a, a big data machine learning uh, attempt? Certainly, like one of the big things when you actually use machine learning is that you train your data to understand how, it, what kind of results you can get or predict something or forecast. Uh, whereas when you use simulations, one, the, one of the big aspects is that uh, using initial uh, input uh, data that you can extract, simulation allows you to understand and predict what has happened uh, without actually working with the data directly. So you have the initial parameters, initial uh, algorithm with the initial uh, input param uh, input uh, data, but there is no more interaction with it in order in terms of calibrating it. All right. And uh, there's another group of people and they're theoretical physicists who abhor large numbers of parameters. There's a famous anecdote between Freeman Dyson and Enrico Fermi about when Dyson told him he had a model with four parameters and uh, Fermi just replied that, well, John von, von Neumann told me that if I have uh, five parameters, then I can fit an elephant and wiggle his trunk. And that was the end of the conversation. How do you deal with the fact that you might be, uh, you know, you might have too many parameters for your model to be useful? 
so uh, for instance, uh, when I investigated uh, in the second iteration, we had seven parameters uh, with different values. Uh, and uh, when we run it, executing the uh, Eagle machine, we had around 78,000 uh, jobs. Uh, but the main aspect is uh, not only the uh, how we execute it in terms of the number of jobs. I think the importance is that uh, first is identifying the main pivotal ones and, and tackling them one by one in order to understand how they are uh, changed or to compare it with the overall validation results. Right, thanks. I think at this point we need to move on because we're running slightly over schedule. Thanks again, Diana, very much. Thank you. And uh, we move to the next talk and it, that's by Dongwei Ye. So let's get his uh, loaded on screen. Dongwei is from the University of Amsterdam for informatics there. And he's talking about uh, an application of semi-intrusive UQ to a multi-scale model of instant restenosis. Let's roll the video. Hello everyone, my name is Dongwei. I am a PhD student of computational science lab of the University of Amsterdam. So what I'm going to present today is about semi-intrusive uncertainty quantifications of a multi-scale instant resonosis model. I will start my talk with a short introduction about the semi-intrusive um, uncertainty quantification method and our instant resonosis 2D model. Then I will talk about how it was applied to, well, how we use the semi-intrusive UQ method to do the UQ analysis for our um, multi-scale applications and how we build the circuit model. I will present our result of circuit modelings as well as the UQ and the sensitivity analysis. I will finish my talk um, with conclusions and future work. So um, as computational scientists, we build model to study and to simulate the real world phenomenon. And of course, due to the uh, lack of knowledge or lack of computational powers, our model inevitably uh, involves uncertainties. So we want to do uncertainty quantification to our model. Um, generally, there are several types of um, uncertainty quantification problems, um, for example, forward propagation problems, um, inverse um, problems, or um, sensitivity analysis. Uh, in my cases, I'm doing the forward propagations. Um, well, there is two traditional methods to solve the forward propagation problem. First, intrusive method, in which you expand your governing equations in terms of the uncertainty parameters and you solve it and you will get a solution with respect to your uncertainty, uncertainty input. And the non-intrusive method is more straightforward. You don't touch anything about your uh, model, but just um, you have a mapping between your input and the app output. And the semi-intrusive method was proposed by my colleague Anas uh, recently. It was used to solve uh, for the problems of um, specifically for the multi-scale simulations. So imagine um, the multi-scale simulation is generally very expensive and uh, consists of um, two general, usually two sub-models, a macro model and a micro models. Um, usually the micro model is very expensive because it could be a refined grid um, based the simulations or it could be a fast dynamic model which has to be run a lot of times before the slow dynamics move to the next time step. So the idea of semi-intrusive uh, method is trying to replace um, this expensive sub-model um, or micro-model with a circuit model or a meta-models. Uh, I would like to point you to uh, um, these papers for more details and some intrusive uncertainty propagation for multi-scale models. Um, so come back to our instant restenosis model. So what is restenosis? So uh, it's a very common cardiac disease. Um, uh, some fatty materials get accumulated in your blood vessels. Your blood vessels get narrowed. Uh, one of the uh, therapy to this problem is doing stenting. So you uh, insert a stent together with the blooms into your blood vessels, flow to that specific locations, inflate the blooms, and blooms flows away, the stent will stay there, keep the lumen open. But of course, this while this stent keep the lumen open, it actually apply pressures on the inner side of uh, 
uh, blood vessels and this endothelial layers will be broken and this will trigger a self-healing process during which the smooth muscle cell will start to prolificate. If there is excessive amount of smooth muscle cell prolificate during this process we call it, um, this, your blood vessel get narrowed again and we call this wrist stenosis. So here's the two pictures uh, of uh, um, uh, wrist stenosis. So uh, on the top this is a pictures of uh, uh, right after stand is deployed and the black dot over here are the strut of the stand as you can see it with the lumen is open at this time um, but here is the uh, figures of the uh, 60 days of the standing as you can see here the almost half of the lumen is closed and we call it wrist stenosis so to study this process and um, to avoid the restenosis happening of uh, restenosis, we build our instant restenosis uh, model and um, trying to simulate and this process and study like what, how could we avoid um, restenosis. And this uh, multi-scale instant restenosis model consists of three um, sub-models. First, initial condition model, and it gives us the initial geometries after this um, the stand is deployed. Also, we have a SMC model muscle cell model it's a agent based model which control the state of each smooth muscle cells and also we have a blood flow simulation model it's a safety solver using lattice Boltzmann method so at each time steps when we when the um, when there are new smooth muscle cell popped out um, they were it pop out uh, uh, it will pass down the uh, current domain geometry or lumen geometry to the CFD solvers so for the current fluid state and the uh, uh, current domain geometry domains and output the wash stress this wash stress will be one of the important fact which affect the um, growth of smooth muscle cells and finally we will get a, a clear pictures of uh, of the lumens and we can calculate the new intimate areas um, yeah, so this is the, the new intimate areas, our uh, quantity of interest things. Um, our models has, uh, and so in our models we want to investigate two kind of uncertainty. First, aleatorial uncertainty because of our SMC model are stochastic. We also want to investigate three epistemic um, uncertainty parameters, the deployment depths, which uh, directly decide how much uh, damage you have done to your blood vessels, the blood flow velocities and the endothelial regeneration times, which varies a bit uh, person to person. So we want to see how these uncertain parameters would affect the growth of the new intimate areas. So before I go to the um, uncertain quantification part, I want to show you a video about the, uh, our instant resonosis model. So here you can see uh, we when the IC models give the initial geometries of the blood vessels, and the smooth muscle cell model will start to calculate the uh, state of uh, SMCs and at each time steps we will pass it down to the CFD solvers and calculate the fluid state and the uh, shear stress of fluid will be passed to the uh, each smooth muscle cells around boundaries and take it as an important factor to calculate the uh, growth of smooth muscle cells and finally we will get our new intimate areas. Okay, um, so to do, in order to do the uncertain quantifications for our model, of course, we can do the black box model columns. We can sample from our um, uncertainty uh, distributions, fed it to our models, fit it to our models, and we can get distributions of output. Um, so, uh, but of course, as I said, the multi-scale simulation it will be, itself will be very expensive. We want to improve our computational efficiency, so that's why we do the semi-intrusive method. Um, as I said, the, sum is, the idea of semi-intrusive method is to replace uh, one of the most um, expensive uh, sub-model with a circuit models. In these cases, we want to replace our uh, blood flow simulation, the CFD solvers, with a circuit models. So um, the input of this circuit would be a lumen geometry at current time step. It's a binary map where uh, one represents fluid state, um, fluid domains, and the zero represent the uh, solid domains. And together with the inlet boundary condition, the buffer velocities, we will um, get an output of the shear stress. We don't need the uh, we only need the wash stress along boundaries. We don't need the stress uh, at the rest of the fluid fluid field. 
So uh, to build this circuit model, we actually inspired from the papers in 2016 uh, made by the Autodesk guys. They have um, kind of similar cases. They want to do, um, simulate, they want to get a build a circuit model for a um, static flows, 2D static flow cases from left to right and then with an obstacle in between. But this obstacle could uh, be uh, different shapes. It could be a rectangular. It, be, it could be a um, circles. It could be a car shape um, obstacles. So um, uh, they want to find out a way to uh, f efficiently predict the stress. Um, sorry, efficiently predict the um, the velocity field or the pressure field without solving. Um, using a CFD solvers or solve the Nowistock equation. So they apply this uh, convolutional neural network ideas, uh, which was originally used for the image um, processing. So in my cases, it was, uh, we have similar situations. We have two changing boundary conditions, uh, changing boundaries, um, geometries, the upper boundary and lower boundaries. So uh, we do the same things. We um, input our boundaries uh, informations into the convolutional neural networks, and we use several convolutional layers to do the shape encodings. Then we get our shape code. It's a small, um, it's higher representations, it's higher level representations of our geometries. And together with the velocity inputs through FC layers, we get our stress code. It could be any other parameter codes. It could be a velocity fuse. That it depends uh, what kind of uh, quantities you want to investigate and then with several layers of deconvolution layers uh, we can transform this stress code back to our original space and we can know uh, we can predict our washer stress around boundaries and of course we have um, I said uh, this is a typical re regression problems I set a I mean square errors between the uh, between the real predictions, uh, between the real um, wash shear stress predictions and our convolution neural network predictions um, as uh, loss functions. And also we take around 5,000 data pairs to train our data because uh, to train our circuit models because we, um, in each um, ISO 2D simulations, we have 1,440 time step. And that means um, with four full runs of simulations, we already get um, 5,000 data pairs, which is good enough for training the convolutional neural network circuit, and I will implement these circuit models in the Keras. So here's the result of our circuit models. As you can see here, um, the orange lines are the Lattice, Lattice Boltzmann method um, results, which we take as a ground choose, and the green dash line are the convolutional neural network surrogate result. They are pretty close to each other, and uh, convolutional neural network predict the wash stress quite well. But of course, there is cases, for example, over here and over here, the shear stresses are overestimated. This is because of the um, uh, extrapolation cases, because we have quite high dimensional inputs. Um, uh, the, the extrapolation is kind of inevitable in my cases, but um, this is already good enough to um, to for a circuit model. We will replace the original CFD solver with this circuit model and then run the uh, UQ analysis. So let's take a look at the result of uh, some quantifications. At the bottom is a mean and standard deviations um, of uh, our uncertain, uncertain output, the new intermediate areas around times. As you can see, um, the green line is the uh, quasi Monte Carlo result, and the orange lines are the uh, semi intrusive result. They're very close to each other. But of course, there is small error in between them and start to grow along the times. This is because our model itself is a cyclic model. So every time step, we will call our circuit model. Models. Of course, our circuit model has small errors, so this small error introduced by circuit model will propagate um, and propagate and accumulate at each time steps. So uh, that's why we see a small difference uh, of our uncertainty quantifications. And uh, here, this two PDF above here is uh, is the PDFs at the final time steps and the dash line here is at the real um, at the threshold of um, restenosis so if um, the result was is above um, the threshold we call it restenosis happening if it is below that it's not happening so as I said because the error introduced by circuit models 
the semi-intrusive method with slightly underestimate uh, the resonosis, which is 8% over here and 9% um, for the horizontal column results. We also do the um, sensitivity analysis. We estimate the um, sober sensitivity indices. So the pictures at, uh, at right is uh, the variance of each uncertainty uh, parameters and the picture at the right is the sobo indices of each parameters at each um, time step. So um, the solar lines are the predictions given by the uh, quasi Monte Carlo result and the dash lines are the predictions given by the semi intrusive result. As you can see here, they're also very close to each other. Uh, and the, for the VRS estimations, um, the semi intrusive method was all um, slightly overestimated, but the uh, semi uh, but the sensitivity indices is is, uh, is much better because they are all overestimated. So uh, the overestimation was kind of cancelled when you divide one by another. So um, here's the conclusions of uh, my talks. Um, we have done this uh, UQ and the sensitivity analysis of our ISO, ISO 2D models. We're trying to improve our uh, computational efficiencies uh, by applying the semi-intrusive UQ method with the circuit models. Uh, we get a speed above around seven applying the semi-intrusive method. And of course, our UQ and sensitivity analysis results showed that the semi-intrusive UQ has a uh, good match with the result of quasi Monte Carlo result. In the futures, we want to apply our um, we want to apply a uh, certain quantification to our more complex and realistic um, instant resonosis 3D models. Of course, uh, in that in the 3D cases, the CFD solvers take even longer, uh, even more computational uh, effort. So we also want to apply semi-intrusive to improve computational efficiencies. And that's it. Thank you very much. And questions. Very good. Thank you, Dong Wei. Can I just check that you're hearing me loud and clear and I can hear you? Uh, yes, I'm here, Peter. Good news. All right, you've got a couple of questions that I'm gonna uh, ask you from the audience. The first is from uh, Federico INGV, which seems like an abbreviation, I haven't found out what that means, but his question is the following. How many simulations are necessary to train the network so as to be sure that the surrogate model is accurate? Um, yes, um, thank you for the questions. So, uh, in my, so in my cases, we are doing a pre-trained model, a pre-trained surrogate. So we first trained our surrogate by some data and then put into the UK analysis, run the semi-intrusive method and get the results. It's indeed a problem that like, um, uh, whether this, um, the, accu the accuracy of our surrogate will um, remain good during our UK analysis because uh, typically we are building the surrogate model for the micro models and sometimes we don't know uh, where it will go um, during the simulation because uh, it takes intermediate um, output from the macro models and somewhere it, it may cause somewhere doing extrapolations and produce bad results and uh, well, make our um, UK estimations uh, bad. So um, to cope with that problems, we are actually trying to find out um, doing something called uh, online training. So why are you doing the UQ? Um, we can try. Uh, we can try to build a surrogate online. Um, after few runs of uh, Monte Carlo runs, we get some data, and we try to train our surrogate. And uh, we will do a, a statistical test during this UQ analysis. Um, so for example, when we find that the surrogate is not um, accurate enough, uh, when we run some samples, uh, we will you know, um, take more data, uh, retrain this surrogate, and uh, then use this um, retrain surrogate to do the surrogate, uh, to, to make the estimations again. But this is in the process. Um, uh, th this online surrogate is um, uh, developing right now, so um, led by Valters. Uh, we are trying to make a new toolkit called um, easy surrogate and it may solve that problem. Great and of course the easy surrogate will soon become part of the Vecna toolkit which will be very interesting. I've got one other question that I can uh, fit in here very briefly if you can answer briefly it's from John McCullough. He says does your two or asks does your 2D model account for cylindrical shape of vessels 
would using a 3D model make an impact on your results? And the upper and lower walls are close together, so the radi radius of the vessel is a significant factor in how the fluid flow evolves. In 3D, the flow would be more constricted through the gap between the expanded walls. Please answer quickly because we must move on. Yes, yes. Um, so uh, for the 2D models, we uh, simplified the cases. It was just two kind of like uh, two parallel plate. And for 3D, uh, yes, it would be more precise. We have a uh, cylinder shape of blood vessels. And uh, uh, yeah, so for the 2D, we are just trying to test out whether the semi intrusive is good, uh, semi intrusive method is a good method to do the UQ analysis. And we further apply this semi intrusive method to our 3D cases, which is more um, complex and, and realistic. Yes. All right. Thank you. There is one other question, but I hope you can type your answer to that as we have to move on now. So uh, that question is coming from Olivier Fernan. Could you, uh, uh, could I thank you again for your talk there, Dong Weiye, and let's move to the final talk of this uh, session. And this is from Frederick Janssen, and he's at a, a thing called um, the CWI, which is the Centrum Viscunde and Informatica, the National Research Institute for Mathematics and Computer Science in the Netherlands, which has a claim to fame as being uh, uh, the place in which the Python programming language was created. So, Frederick, uh, take it away with the video now. Hi, everyone. I'm Frederick Jansson. My talk is about atmospheric modeling and quantifying the uncertainty in atmospheric models. Specifically, I will talk about DALES, a large eddy simulation, and about analyzing DALES with the newly developed ECVV UQ toolkit. ECVV UQ is developed in the VECMA project, an EU project concerned with exascale computing and verification. DALES is a local atmospheric model it is typically run on a domain of 10 to 100 kilometers and with a resolution of 10 to 100 meters. This resolution means that DALES can resolve processes like clouds and convection and also some of the turbulence. Clouds, for example, have size scales of 500 meters and up. In global weather models, individual clouds are not seen because the resolution cannot be made high enough. DALES works by keeping track of atmospheric quantities like temperature, humidity, and the air velocity, and calculates how they evolve over time. As results, one can, for example, compute the cloud fraction, the height of the clouds, and the rain amount. There are multiple sources of uncertainty in the model output. The most traditional type in uncertainty quantification is uncertain physical parameters, such as the sea surface temperature or the cloud droplet concentration. These are parameters that have to be specified when running the model, but their precise values may not be known. And uncertainty in these parameters translate into uncertainty in the model output. Then there are model choices. In DALES, for example, one can select different advection schemes or different microphysics parameterizations, and these choices affect the model output to some degree. Similar to the model choices are numerical settings, like the floating point precision used, or tolerance for an iterative method. These are often trade-offs between accuracy and computing time. Another source of uncertainty is uncertainty in the initial state of the model. DALES is often initialized with specified vertical profiles of the model variables, with some small random noise added in the horizontal direction. Generating this noise differently with a different random seed will make the, the clouds form in different spots and then make the simulation different. Uncertainty quantification is about measuring the impact of such uncertain model inputs on the results, typically by running the model many times for different parameter choices. The tool I've used for this is ECVVUQ. 
ECVVUQ stands for Verification, Validation and Uncertainty Quantification. ECVVUQ is an open source Python framework which analyzes a model by running it many times with different parameters. One specifies a set of parameters to vary and their distributions. As a result, one gets probability distributions of the model output quantities and Sobol indices which measure how much of the uncertainty in the output can be attributed to the uncertainty of each input quantity. ECVVUQ is currently being developed in the VECMA project. We are looking for more early users, so if you are interested in using it on your own models, let us know. There are links and references at the end of the talk. As an example with DALES, I will show you a certain standard test case, uh, rain in cumulus over ocean, or RICO for short. It was uh, set up as a model comparison case and is based on field observations. Uh, it was run on many different models, uh, which always started with the, the same initial state. And this is a nice case for testing because it's a case of scientific interest and it's also small enough that we can afford to run it for hundreds hundreds of times for an uncertainty quantification campaign. To run an uncertainty quantification experiment we define output quantities to analyze. Some of them are shown in the plot on the vertical axis. Surface precipitation, surface flux of moisture and heat and the computing time. We also define quantities to vary and intervals for them to vary over. Here I show the cloud droplet concentration and the sea surface temperature, and we also vary the surface roughness length in this experiment. Then ECVVUQ generates a grid of points in parameter space and runs the model for each of these points. As output, we can look at the scatter plots of all the runs as shown here, or compute Sobel indices for each of the parameters. In this example, it turns out that the sea surface temperature is responsible for most of the uncertainty in most of the output quantities. An exception is the surface precipitation, which also depends on the cloud droplet concentration. This is something that can be expected from how the model is formulated, because generation of rain is dependent on the concentration of cloud droplets. I want to highlight another source of uncertainty in large eddy modeling, the chaotic behavior of the model itself. Weather and weather models are famous for being chaotic systems, so that any change in the initial state or the parameters give rise to a completely different run with, for example, different clouds. In fact, the field of chaos theory exploded in the 1960s when Edward Lorenz noticed the sensitivity to initial conditions of his weather model runs. As an illustration of this, there are three runs of the RICO case. And the green one is the baseline case. Uh, the orange is initialized identically to the baseline, but with a 1 millikelvin warmer sea surface. And the gray case is the same as the baseline, but with a different random noise in the initial fields. The images show the liquid water path two hours into the simulation. And we see that the tiny different, uh, tiny change in parameter between the first two runs has already made the two simulations slightly different and from here on they will diverge further with a different random seed has completely different clouds. One quantity which is particularly sensitive to the cloud organization and which varies a lot from one run to the next is the rain rate as seen here in the graph. The RICO case is quite small and there is space for only one rain event at once and this explains why the rain varies from run to run. Uh, 
To reduce these variations, a larger domain would certainly help. But still, in order to see which output quantities are sensitive to the model's chaotic behavior, one should run an, run an ensemble of models initialized with different random noise. In weather forecasts, ensembles are routinely used. In research, however, it's less common, so experiments still tend to be one-off runs of, uh, of the models. When comparing model output, um, for example, comparing different models which, with each other, a small, running a small ensemble instead of single runs would show which differences between the models are robust and which might be just uh, the chaotic noise. Such ensembles and uncertainty quantification runs might be a good use of future exascale machines as a complement to the single very high accuracy runs. I will stop here and leave you with the references. Uh, thank you for listening and thanks for having me here in this virtual way. Frederick, uh, thank you very much for that. Can you hear me and can I hear you? I'm here, hello. Very good. Uh, so I've got a couple of questions for you here now. Serge Guias as follows. Congratulations on trying UQ on an atmospheric model and on the great choice of background paintings depicting uncertainties. But now his questions. How did you summarize high dimensional inputs such as surface temperature? Any impact of this reduction in your analysis uh, thank you. And uh, for the sea surface temperature, we use uh, a single value. Uh, it's also quite common in uh, larger simulations to just assume that uh, there is a single temperature of the surface. So in this respect, we, we follow what's uh, typically done. Uh, in the RICO case, which we analyzed in this uncertainty quantification campaign, the sea surface also had a single temperature specified. All right, and then we've got Yigar Parekh, who again congratulates you for a nice talk and follows it with two questions. The first one is this, do you also consider uncertainty in the large eddy simulation models? Um, I'm not sure how to interpret this. So, of course, every model is wrong in some way. Uh, we're not trying to validate it uh, against experiments in this particular case. We're more interested in seeing how the model itself reacts to varying the parameters. So I guess uh, to measure how, how much the model itself is off, we would need to compare it with something else, which would be observations. And uh, this, of course, has uh, it's, it's generally difficult to, to gather observations um, in, in uh, over space and time in an accurate, accurate way. So, so this kind of comparison comes with its own challenges. Thank you. And the second question from Digar Parekh is, can I use VVUQ to obtain a Cajon and Lurve expansion of a random field? The fast answer is I don't know. Um, what you, you can do is uh, obtain uh, polynomials as approximations of how the model uh, reacts to the parameters. So maybe this takes you a bit in this direction, but I'm not sure. There's, there's some documentation if you follow the links or just search for the ECVVQ page. Ah, okay, I see Walter says there's no Carvin and Leve expansion at present. There isn't one, so that's the end of it. All right. Um, thanks. I've got a couple of questions for you because you finished a little earlier. I was certainly fascinated by your comments about uh, the lack of so what, what we call ensemble simulations in uh, what sound to be like the academic environment. 
if you were doing weather forecasting with a vengeance and people need to know badly if it's going to rain tomorrow, as often the case in the UK, uh, we have very large supercomputers to do that. The reason why people in academia are only running one, as you put it, one-off simulation, is that because they lack the resources to do it? To do the ensemble an analysis? Maybe it's, it's more about how you use the resources. Um, so, so you can either make a bigger simulation or you can, you can run many small ones. And um, it seems the choice has often been to, to go for the one big simulation instead of uh, a, a lot of the small ones. But um, I have to say um, the sensitivity to these uh, initial conditions, it varies a lot uh, between the different uh, output quantities. So you can get very good results, for example, for the cloud fraction, the amount of the sky that's uh, cloudy. And uh, rain is especially difficult because it, uh, it's, it turns out to be very sensitive to how the clouds organize and uh, the particular case. So, so it's not the, the field is universally bad by, by not doing ensembles. Um, it's more that certain quantities can be quite sensitive. And then it's, it, I think it would be good to, to do ensembles and at least know which quantities are sensitive. Yes, I mean, I mean, it just happens that that's a topic of immense interest to me, but not uh, so much in the uh, weather forecasting and climate modeling as in molecular dynamics. We got to talk about that yesterday from Chun Zhu Wong. The problems are very similar. And we have uh, a, quite a sort of regular discussion, if, if you like. It's supposedly an old chestnut in that community, though it, I believe it to be a false dichotomy between one long simulation, many short ones, because of the instabilities uh, that exist chaotically, uh, my answer is uh, it's a, the false dichotomy. So you better run ensembles of simulations, no matter what uh, their duration. Otherwise, you're going to miss lots of interesting things. And, um, and, and in particular, if you run a very long simulation, it's subject to chaotic instabilities. That you know, when you go beyond the, the Lyapunov time, you could imagine that the numerics are, are, are transferring you onto an orbit which isn't the one you thought you were on initially. And effectively, these long simulations, no matter how quote big, are, can have increasingly high levels of inaccuracy on them. The, the other obvious benefit where you can run lots of short ones is on a big machine, clearly. You, you can get them all done at once. So you're in an actionable prediction situation. The wall clock time of a short simulation then tells you what to do, whereas a long one might end up telling you tomorrow's weather in three weeks time, which is clearly not useful to the majority of recipients of your information. What do you think about that? Mm, I agree. Uh, and uh, also with these weather models, um, you can think there is uh, self-averaging, both uh, if you make the simulation domain larger and if you make the time longer. But uh, the case for ensembles is that uh, if you run, say, two or three uh, simulations as, an, as the minimum, instead of just one, then uh, you immediately get the measure of the spread between these uh, ensemble members. And then you have some, some measure of how, how sensitive the quantities are. And um, and the other thing to keep in mind somehow, if, um, if you make the domain larger, is that uh, then the clouds may also organize over, over a larger scale. There might be some self-organization, which um, works against uh, the self-averaging. So, so for this reason also, I think uh, ensembles would be the way to go. Great. Well, thank you very much, Frederick. We're now uh, getting to the end of the morning session, uh, I'd like to um, collectively on behalf of the audience, which is pretty large, fluctuating a little bit, but on average, we seem to have had around 75 to 80 people, not just on the Zoom call, but something like 15 or more tuning in to uh, the YouTube broadcast. So that, that's very good news for us. Thanks, therefore, to all the speakers in this session. And just uh, one final thing before we we break for lunch is uh, that the speakers and uh, chair for the next session should make sure they do stay 
on logged on to the conference for reasons we discussed last time as well, just to make sure we can set things up correctly with them. They don't need to interact with it during the lunch break, but they need to stay on and uh, therefore they can go off and have lunch like everybody else. So with that, let me just remind you, the lunch break is now from 13.10, uh, 1.10 p.m. to 2.10 p.m. Continental European time, that's uh, 10 past 12 to 10 past one um, in the UK. So we resume at 2.10 p.m. or 1.10 p.m. UK time uh, after for the afternoon session. Thanks again to everyone who's tuned in to listen and of course to the speakers. Bye for now. Hello everyone, uh, it's uh, very good to, to see you all. So first of all, thanks for uh, joining this uh, uh, session of the Multiscale Modeling Workshop. Uh, I won't take any time from the speakers, so I think we can. Uh, I can start introducing the first speaker of uh, this session, which is Sergei Gogolenko from the High Performance Computing Center in Stuttgart, and uh, he's going to talk about the challenges and solution of uh, global challenges in high performance computing. So, looking forward to his talk. Hello everyone, in this talk I will tell you about Hidalgo project, or more precisely about the technologies we use in this project to accurately simulate global challenges on data centers infrastructure via coupling of models and data sources. This is an, an introductory talk in a series of talks about Hidalgo in this session. One of the key uh, goals of our project is an evidence-based policy making for global challenges via accurate simulation of them. Accurate digital twinning of the global challenges leads to computationally expensive coupled simulations. These simulations bring together not only different models for social and physical phenomena, often multi-scale by design, but also various sources of massive static and streaming datasets. In order to deal with computationally Com computational complexity of the simulations we use resources of HPC centers. As a result, on the one hand, we have high performance computing and data centers, which typically operate on static data, on efficient parallel and distributed file systems, have strict security restrictions for external data sources, and offer different proprietary software models and data. On the other hand, we have global challenges, which combine computational expensive models and are greedy to data from external data sources. It leads to the following problems. How to involve external data sources into the simulations, static simulations? And the second problem is how to couple across data centers. In order to establish the baseline for a generalized solution, in our project we rely on twinning of three representative global challenges. Let's go quickly through them. In the migration, a use case, we tried to simulate and analyze data about movement of refugees from conflict regions. We operate with data about weather and climate, UN refugee agency data, food security and telecommunication data. We use micro and macro scale models based on modeling and simulation with, with, uh, with agents, weather of climate forecasts, geoinformation systems. Most of the codes is implemented in C++ and Python. Our software was used to analyze conflicts in Burundi, Central African Re Republic, uh, South Sudan, as well as Mali. In the urban uh, air pollution use case, we design a digital twin for the spread of vehicular air pollution in the cities. We operate with data about weather and climate, streaming data from sensors, data about geometry of the city extracted from open and closed sources. We use agent-based modeling and simulation for traffic, for simulating traffic, a computational fluid dynamics air quality in the cities of Gior, Stuttgart, Milwaukee. 
In social network analysis use case, we analyze spread of messages in social networks. We operate with streaming data from Twitter, telecommunication data, data about social networks from open data sets. We use agent-based modeling and simulation for simulating spread of messages, numerical linear algebra and network analytics tools for analysis of the results. Recently, we used uh, our software to analyze tweets about COVID-19. The global challenge discussed above were used uh, to construct a generalized workflow for simulation scenarios. You can see it in this figure. The data source phase denotes the starting point into the workflow, including local files as well as external APIs. Then follows data extraction, data synthesis, and data processing phases. Afterwards, we have model generation phase, and only then uh, simulation phase take place. After simulation phase, we have analytics phase, which in case of successful validation and verification of results, allows to report policies. In Hidalgo, this workflow is implemented with the following architecture. In order to establish a computational infrastructure, we exploit, resor exploit resources of the three leading European high performance computing centers. High performance computing center, Stuttgart, Poznan Supercomputing and Networking Center, as well as European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecasts. HLRS and PSNC provide resources for general purpose applications, while uh, ECMWF provides access to the forecast models outputs, weather forecast models outputs. The overall execution is orchestrated and monitored by Cloudify. Streaming data is integrated with Apache Kafka. CCAN serves as a management, data management system and data catalog. Out of the box, Cloudify, Cloudify supports clouds and basic and uh, acyclic coupling mechanisms. It is based on Oasis Tosca standard and has an attractive web GUI. Finally, Cloudify is extensible, it is extensible via plugins. To extend the functionality of Cloudify required by our project, we developed a plugin called Croupier. This plugin already supports HPC and HPDA workflow, workload managers and data catalogs. Uh, the work on Torque and Slurm is in release, while the work on Mesos and CCAN support is in a better version for testing. Additionally, we started to work on extending Croupier with cyclic coupling mechanisms. Locally simulated parts of model, models for our representative global challenges rely on a number of acyclic and cyclic couplings. Uh, some of them are presented on this slide. In order to establish such couplings, we use tools like FabSim and Maskell. SICAN is used for linking external static data sources. It, pr it provides consistency in harvesting the data and post-processing and pre-processing of the data, Adequ adequate level of security, Extensible. Finally, it is extensible via plugins, which is very helpful for our project again. It uh, allows to deliver data with files, links to external sources, and profiled harvesters. The streaming data is integrated in our project via Apache Kafka. We use the following sources of streaming data, Twitter data, uh, camera-based traffic data and monitor-based uh, data about air pollution. In our cross-data-centric couplings, the role of specialized data center is assigned to ECMWF, who provides weather and climate data and forecasts. The coupling is implemented in two steps. The first one is static coupling, where we try to couple with historical data about weather and climate, useful for cali model calibration and verification purposes. Uh, and the second step, we do dynamic coupling, via coupling with for weather forecast data, uh, via a RESTful API. 
The architecture of coupling implementation is in the background of the slide. The client side is implemented in the, with the free and open source software piece called Polytop. Uh, cross data centric coupling is probably one of the most interesting and innovative bits in our coupling activities. For further details, I refer you to the talk of Milana Vučković later on in this session. The future work in the project assumes the following steps. We intend to develop mechanisms for moving and handling large uh, simulation results, improve mechanisms for a cyclic coupling across data centers, implement strong coupling in the case studies, evaluate performance for the proposed solutions. Last but not least, I would like to mention that this is a collaborative project which involves 11 par partners from different European countries. Some of the key partners and contributors to this talk are presented on this slide. Thank you for your listening to this talk. Thank you for your attention. And please stay for later discussions in this session. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Sergey. So I think we can uh, open up to question. If there is no question from the audience, maybe I will uh, come up with a couple. Uh, Sergey, can you hear me? Yeah, thank you. Stefano. Yeah, hello. Very nice talk, by the way. Very impressive work, very complete. I, I like it a lot. So um, let me ask you a couple of questions. So how can you indeed implement a stronger coupling mechanism for uh, your architecture? Uh, you mean, how do we intend to... Well, okay, in, in our activities, uh, we assume a little bit to inv invest our time into implementation of strong coupling within Krupier plugin, uh, the plugin for Cloudify. In this plugin, we uh, want to use some grid solutions and uh, yeah, to try to, to involve some grid solutions for, uh, and, and to try somehow in better orchestration in this mechanism. Actually, um, I guess during the first day where there was a more elaborate discussion of this Krupier plugin uh, done by Javier Nieto from Atos. And yeah, probably he discussed it a little bit uh, more details. Okay. Um... Let me ask you a naive question, please, then, <clears throat> then you're free to go. Uh, you mentioned that you guys uh, um, basically worked also a little bit on messages and uh, Twitters about COVID. Is that correct? Yeah, we start that uh, activity just started a couple of months ago, maybe. For maybe obvious less. reasons. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, <laughs> like anyone, uh, everyone almost started to work in this direction. And yeah, yeah, so everyone. We're working everyone. in global challenges. That's our... Uh, one of the activities which we could not uh, leave, ahead, leave, leave somehow behind our scope. Definitely, definitely. Okay, okay. That uh, that was a very interesting talk. Thank you so much. If uh, if there is no other question, then uh, I think I'm gonna introduce the next speaker, which is uh, Imran Mahmoud from uh, Brunel University that uh, it's going to give us the, the last update on the agent-based model of uh, forced migration, which uh, I am a very super big fan of, by the way, let me tell you that. So I'm really looking forward to your talk. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm going to present an agent-based multi-scale simulation of forced migration, a case study of South Sudan. I'm Imran Mahmood, and I'm representing a team which is working on an EU Horizon 2020 funded project titled Hidalgo. We are from Brunel University London and European Centre for Medium Range weather, weather, weather Forecasts. I'll start with a brief overview and preamble. Forced migration is an involuntary movement of persons away from their local regions. According to UN Refugee Agency, UNHCR, roughly 71 million people are have been forcefully displaced worldwide. This include major, ma majorly include regions from Africa, Middle Africa, um, Middle East, Afghanistan, and Venezuela. 
human migration is of two types voluntary and forced uh, or involuntary involuntary migration may occur due to internal conditions or external conditions internal conditions include violence worsening of socio economic conditions famine natural disasters whereas external conditions may include deterioration of the environment global inequality external impact on local economies economies deterioration of the environment refugee movements matter and it is important to be able to predict where refugees go this is because to be able to save refugee lives as it helps governments and ngos to correctly allocate humanitarian resources to refugee camps to help complete incomplete data collection on refugee movements and to investigate the consequences of a nation closing its border for refugees <clears throat> in migration modeling we do collection of data from humanitarian organization such as un refugee agency unhcr or ecled which is armed conflict location and even data we construct uh, we develop multi scale agent based simulations to predict refugee movements Imran, I'm afraid uh, your presentation stopped. I don't know if it's on your side or uh, on uh, Hugh's side. Apologies, my Zoom call just crashed. Is everyone still there? Stefano, can you hear me? I'm here, I'm here, yes. So yeah, apologies for that. I can um, just reconnect it now. Please to build multi-scale model of South Sudan scenario and simulate the refugee movements. Over approach integrates a micro model covering three provinces in south sudan which are in this color upper nile gambela and jongli at a high resolution with the with a individual agent walks and uh, uh, and locations and with the macro model covering the rest of the south sudan and neighboring countries at a relatively low low resolution constructing macro scale and micro scale models for the south sudan conflict this is the overview of the different locations this rectangle represent the micro model part whereas rest of the locations belong to the macro model the simulation period is selected from 1st june 2016 to 31st july 2017 this is because of the availability of validation data there have been select we have selected 58 conflict location in the macro model and 36 conflict location in the micro model 21 camps in the neighboring countries including Ethiopia, Kenya, Sudan and Uganda are selected. Coupling locations that connect macro and micro model include Bor, Pochala and Panya Gang. We also uh, include uh, weather data uh, and particularly the precipitation data for the micro model between 2016 and 2017. the level of precipitation this is because the level of precipitation affect an agent's move chance and its walk speed so this figure shows the region of the south sudan with different pre precipitation levels and those conflict location in uh, shown in red dots uh, are are uh, are uh, the points where these uh, precipitation data is used for the decision of the agent move movements Let's discuss the simulation approach which is multi scale agent based simulation. We divide over a uh, flee framework which is an open source uh, uh, open source simulation uh, API 
<clears throat> developed in python into multiple phases phase 1 include pro problem selection which is the choice of country at the time and the time period in phase 2 we uh, gather the data which include the conflict data for the construction of conflict zones the geospatial information for the construction of the location graph that includes the routes and the distances and the un data refugee data for the for the uh, for the assignment of camps camp locations and the refugees uh, initialization data the population of refugees this data set once the model is constructed is used in the flee code in the flee report uh, flee um, simulation code and uh, it also include uh, in information about border closures and forced redirections and the and the initial population data once the simulation is executed using the supercomputing platform the results are generated and they are analyzed using validation data which is collected from the un uh, hcr data set this is an overview of the conceptual model used in flee so once the simulation starts we have time steps over current time step is based on days and uh, for until the simulation is uh, completed we continue and pick a agent in the list and then we we decide about the movement of the agent its destination is picked and its uh, movement is uh, calculated once the agent is moved it is uh, until the agent is moved it is uh, in the move step once it is finished the next agent is selected for the evolution of the simulation once all the agents have been processed uh, in an iteration the next increment on the time step is generated uh besides the conceptual model we also have a model coupling which is between the macro model and the micro model as previously discussed the logic behind the macro and micro model is parallel synchronization runs due to the time overlap so since both models are uh, concurrently executed so there is a time overlap and uh, then they are synchronized using a parallel synchronization algorithm we use muscle 3 open source api for the coupling of the two models both macro and micro model have coupling links which are the coexisting locations in the in the geography of south sudan now i will request my colleague ali raza to give more details on our model coupling approach thank you amra well in order to a uh, multi scale simulation of south sudan conflict which includes parallel synchronized runs due to a uh, time overlap where a macro scale model comprises eight regions of south sudan and 14 camps in four neighboring uh, countries and uh, the micro scale model which focuses on force margin movements uh, from upper nile and jumblai regions towards uh, ethiopian camps in uh, gambella we create uh, both models uh, for the same conflict period between 1st june of 2016 till uh, 31st july 2017 uh, in the micro scale model uh, we aim to capture key walking routes and roads in uh, mountainous areas in Uh, eastern south sudan they also increase the level of detail in terms of locations and uh, incorporate a broader range of relevant phenomena such as uh, weather conditions communications and food security so macro models uh, consist of uh, additional values for location and link types uh, it's worth to add that uh, both macro and micro model uh, have coupling links or uh, coupling locations uh, that uh, coexist in both models and agents uh, will respond from micro to macro through uh, ghost locations uh, which i will be, uh, define them uh, later uh, by using a specific uh, function in a coupling library uh, named add ghost location function uh, which will uh, add ghost conflict zones to macro model and besides uh, by using another function named add uh, micro conflict locations we can couple all conflict locations in uh, macro model 
And finally, uh, we have developed a PMicro3 library for coupled uh, multi-scale simulations and uh, we embed uh, marker and ghost location types uh, which uh, they have been added to a location class in PMicro3. And uh, in order to uh, coupling a macro and micro models, uh, we use uh, the concept of ghost locations, uh, which I told you before. Uh, these types of locations are not connected to any links, and then the coupler can identify any conflict zones uh, with uh, zero links automatically as ghost locations. And therefore, ghost locations are a speci uh, special type of coupling uh, locations where uh, the macro model inserts agents into these locations according to the normal flea uh, agent insertion algorithm. And then, at each time of step, the coupling transfers uh, all agents from each ghost locations in the macro model to the real location in the macro model. And as you see in these maps, on the left side there is a macro model map, and inside that map uh, there is another map uh, which uh, reflects our micro model uh, that you can see on the right side of this slide. And there are a lot of cities in there, three of them circled uh, in red. Uh, they are coupled locations, and the other uh, red dot locations, which are conflict locations in our micro model will be added as ghost locations to the macro model and then we can start our multi-scale simula simulations uh, based on this uh, assumption and in order to uh, simulate the south sudan conflict and using coupling and a uh, multi-scale simulation we have taken uh, four approaches in the first approach, uh, we are simulating um, uh, the whole South Sudan with three root 32. In the second approach, uh, which is simulating the multi-scale version of South Sudan, uh, we do it uh, without any coupling, just uh, macro and micro. In the third approach, uh, we do uh, the multi-scale simulation by the file-based coupling approach and developing uh, the new p micro library which addresses the both p and micro characteristics. And in the fourth approach, uh, we have used a multi-scale simulation by the muscle tree coupling, uh, which is implemented by Hamid. Uh, but uh, personally I haven't tried it on South Sudan and so we don't have any results uh, for that yet but uh, in the near future uh, and, as, uh, and once I've tried it uh, the results will be published uh, and you can refer to that uh, thank you uh, I will hand over to Imran and he will continue with some uh, results we have got Imran these are the preliminary simulation results and they are also compared with the validation data collected from the UNHCR data set. So on x-axis we have the days, so we have run about 500 days of simulation and this y-axis shows the progression of uh, population of agents and their, their uh, so, the, so it's an increase of number of agents uh, over the days. Uh, the other location is East Darfur, in which there is a more close link between the real validation data, real world validation data, and the simulated curve. And another location is Rhino, in which we have a um, little bit of deviation. In, in conclusion, a case, we have presented a case study of South Sudan refugee modeling which is being carried out as a uh, EU, grant, EU project uh, titled Hidalgo under the grant of Hidalgo. In this presentation, we discuss the rationale, design and the approach of our multi-scale models, specification of our coupled application <clears throat> and the preliminary validation results. Our study deals with the problem associated with the migration decision support. <clears throat> and it addresses challenges in the domain of multi-scale computing. Thank you. I would like to have any questions, if there is any question.
Imran, thank you. Thank you. Sorry, let me open up the video. Thank you so much for uh, this very nice presentation. Like I said, I'm, uh, I am a very good, uh, uh, big fan of this project. I, uh, I basically open up a discussion on the chat, but I would like to uh, ask you directly this question. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Hello. So um, it's a very impressive work. I like it a lot. And uh, I was wondering if you think that there's going to be any value integrating into your model uh, something like the political swing of foreign countries like the European community. So I, base, I, I am from Italy originally and I, uh, I saw how um, whenever uh, the government changed, for example, from a a moderate government to a far right government, the politics that they put in change basically to stop immigration whatsoever. So maybe this is something that can impact the behavior of the model. What do you think about it? Yeah, I think uh, let me give you the two perspectives of this question. First is the technical perspective. So I will directly go with the technical part. So FLEA uh, library, FLEA API is a continuously evolving code. And uh, all we need to do is to mechanize the rule set that we are building for the movements of agents. So, so that the whole idea behind the FLEA um, agent-based movement is to, to, in, to upgrade the uh, rule set. So for now, we are currently focusing on the rule set based on the existing data that we collected from the humanitarian organizations and the weather, weather incorporation of weather. Uh, also, we are also, also planning to do communication data, which will be, which will be made available through a, through a partner, a Hidalgo partner, and then we can use that communication data for, for constructing a, a more uh, sophisticated rule set. To answer your question, I think the most important part, which is also raised from this uh, chat, is uh, how will we collect this um, uh, data, either from Twitter or any other source. So once we once we are able to to, to select a, a, a prominent data set, all we need to do is to upgrade our rule set, and that will help uh, uh, in, incorporate, integrate the new new features that that we are talking about. Uh, let me tell you, we were also uh, um, co collaborating with Institute of Migration in UK, IOM, and they have also given us some more ideas on uh, IDPs, which are internally displaced um, people, and there are more directions to the, to the current work that we are currently doing on the South, South Sudan case study. So yes, the, the uh, overall uh, response is that uh, with the changes in rule set, uh, the, the, uh, the, the flee, the migration flow can be upgraded based on uh, so many parameters and the features that, that, can, that, that can be done. And um, we, we need to do more uh, countries. For example, we are planning to make four, four or five more models of different scenarios other than South Sudan. So these these things will up, uh, come across, and and we are we are planning to do to handle these uh, issues, especially the political part. Yeah, this is uh, this is very impressive. I I I really always uh, so glad to hear about this project. Really, congratulations! I like it a lot. Okay, uh, I I invite all the attendees to keep up the discussion about these first two talks that we heard. So I think we can uh, uh, actually go to the next one, uh, which is uh, Milana Vukovic. Uh, from the European Center for uh, Medium Range Weather Forecast. Uh, I think it's a very similar topic from the first talk that we heard. It's just probably more focus about the climate change and uh, air quality information. So I'm uh, re really looking forward to your talk. Thank you so much. Hello, my name is Milana. I work at ECNWF on Hidalgo project, and today I will talk about building cloud-based data services to enable earth science workflows across HPC centers. We have all already learned about Hidalgo in this session, so I will give you a brief introduction to ECNWF, who we are and what we do, and I'll present our data challenge to you. At the end, I will talk about the ECNWF role in Hidalgo project. ECMWF stands for European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecast. We are an international intergovernmental organization. We are operational numerical weather prediction center and also research institution. We are operating two Copernicus services, climate change service and atmospheric monitoring service. 
we are also supporting Copernicus Emergency Management Service. We are based in Reading, UK, but our new data center will be built in Bologna in Italy. From the name, you can already tell that we do weather forecast. Our domain is medium range weather forecast, which means forecast for up to 10 uh, days or two weeks in advance. We are also running extended and seasonal range weather forecast, which is from six weeks to six months in advance. We don't do climate prediction, and what we also don't do is short range forecast, which is done on much finer spatial resolution and on much more frequent production schedule. This is the domain of our member states' national MET services. They are, however, using our output for boundary and initial conditions for their regional models. Our works has time critical operational component. We are running our model twice a day, one high resolution model up to 10 days, and ensemble of 50 members up to day 15. As our member states are running their regional models on a much more frequent production schedule, to support this, we have two additional model runs every day with shorter forecast lead time and limited number of products. We are disseminating around 100 terabytes of data daily to around 200 destinations worldwide. We also have a non-time critical component, which is a research within the center, which is constantly updating and improving the model. All of these data produced by our operational and research activities is then archived, and the archive is currently holding more than 300 petabytes of data, and it is the biggest uh, archive of its kind in the world. At the moment, we have two Cray supercomputers with, uh, which are identical. One is operational and the other is a backup and used for research. So if anything happens during the production, one can relatively easily switch to the other. We also have cloud services, which we started building up in the last few years. We, were, we are running Copernicus Climate Data Store operationally since 2018. And together with UMETSAT, we are setting up European Weather Cloud, which is now in the two years pilot phase. And together with UMETSAT and Mercator Ocean, we are involved in Wikio Cloud. As mentioned before, uh, we have our tape archive library with around 140 drives where we archive the data we produce. This brings us to the data challenge. On this first graph, you can see the historical growth of our disseminated data. Only five years ago, this was in the order of about five terabytes. And right now we are at around 30 terabytes. And this is only going to grow further and growing exponentially. If we have a look at the projected volumes of our daily operational and sample data with planned increases in horizontal and vertical resolution, we can see that we are now at 71 terabytes, but in the next five years, it will potentially grow to above 900 terabytes. Another problem is that no user can handle all that data in real time. And unfortunately, a lot of ensemble data goes unused. Because of this, we are continuously looking for ways of trying to encourage users to use more and more data, but it is becoming more of a challenge. Another problem out there is that our methodological users are used to our data, but these domain-specific formats and conventions are not something users from non-methodological domain uh, are familiar with, and that is not making things easier. We do have sophisticated dissemination system to push real-time data to the users, and we are providing web services to allow users to get the data this way too. But the key challenge here is how can we improve users' access to such large volumes of data? How can users uh, access data today? Today we have something called ECNWF Web API, which allows users the access to our public or restricted data sets. Our users from national med services and commercial users can access the full Mars archive and self-registered users can access public data sets. Once a user has an account, they can install ECMWF web API and submit a request. Here we have our specific retrieval example where you would specify meteorologically meaningful parameters. Uh, so precisely what data are you interested in, uh, what area on what area, for which dates and 
then you retrieve it in formats like netcdf or grip and here are the links uh, if anybody wants to try another way to access some of our data is uh, copernicus climate data store it is only data produced for um, uh, Copernicus climate change service, so mostly climate analysis, seasonal forecast data, but also some satellite observations. Because some users might need to work with amount of data that would be too large to download and then process, CDS is also offering a toolbox where the user can process the data before downloading it. Users can also use the toolbox to make specific applications hosted at C CDS. All this data on CDS is open and portal is uh, free to use. But we need to find novel ways of using this data. So how our data flow looks now, we have our HPC, it is producing the data. The data is then goes to our fields database or FTP, which is our dedicated object store for metrological data. And that is basically where we store it immediately after production. Then it goes to disks and tapes. But we want to change how we see things. We see our data as one big hypercube that we would like to provide to people to, uh, to access in the environment that is more in the control of the user, but hopefully closer to our data. So we want to move the compute and not the data. Keep the data where it is, mainly because it is getting too big and bring the computation to the data because computing is getting cheaper and data storage is not. So, Hidalgo and ECDF. Hidalgo is Horizon 2020 project, which is uh, collaboration with uh, across 13 institutions across seven countries. The vision is to advance technology to master global challenges and the mission is then to develop novel methods to HPC and HPDA and so on, and to simulate the complex processes involved with these global challenges. So bridging the gap between how we produce the data and what then we do with the data. Our role in the project is to enable coupling between two uh, pilot applications, so human migration pilot and urban air pollution pilot and our weather data. So, and you have heard more about this uh, coupling work from Sergey in this session. ECMWF role is to enable coupling as means of how to build a workflow. If you think of a spectrum where you could uh, do the data analysis, you could do it on our HPC, but because we are running time critical operations on a tight schedule, our HPC is actually closed system. We could do it in a public cloud, but that would mean reducing the data set, not input all the data to the cloud. So is, the idea is actually to build a cloud to build a private cloud and creating a cloud that is at this NWF, just next to our supercomputer. And then user can bring their workflow and they have very fast access to the full data set. So the key point here is that we want to give some sort of access to our closed HPC system. And this experience with such workflows could be useful model for other HPC system around Europe who have similar restrictions to regarding the access to the HPC. Dalgo, we are uh, collaborating with two HPC centers, so HLS from Stuttgart and PSNC in Poznan, and our cloud facilities will then be connected to these two uh, supercomputers. We have two stage, uh, stages in our work here. First part is what we call static coupling. These simulations have not taken into account our data, so the first, so far. So the first uh, stage of the project is for them to take the static reanalysis data, which is historical weather data, to analyze them and to see how it can be used to integrate and improve their own simulations. In the meantime, we are building uh, the new API to access the data from the cloud. And this part is mostly completed. In the second part of the project, uh, we are concentrating on using the cloud and the REST API uh, to use data while it's hot because weather forecast becomes stale after only less than 12 hours and it, when it's replaced with a new fresh forecast. We are using also experience from building the climate data store too. 
so we want a system where we can bring uh, the user closer, provide them with the computing resources, so move computer to the data. So where we, we are now, we have two systems, one to push the data to the users and uh, the other to pull the data from the archive. We want to have a hybrid system, a platform where you can where you come to the cloud, spin up your virtual machines and bring your, your workflows in. You can access uh, the data as a service. You could also access our hardware directly if you want to control the infrastructure, to be in control of the infrastructure. The service, the service that we've been developing, cloud data as a service is called Polytop. It is deployed at ECMWF and accessible externally. It exposes a REST a RESTful API, and we are providing CLI and a Python API. It will give the user access to Mars or whichever data set the user has permission to access. So how it works, the user submits request, they can pull to see the status of the request, and then when the request is done, the service we've been developing, Cloud Data as a Service, is called Polytop. It is deployed at ECMWF and accessible externally. It exposes a RESTful API, and we are providing CLI and Python API. It will give the user access to Mars or whichever data sets the user has permission to access. So how it works, the user submits a request. They can pull to see the status of the request, and then when the request is done, they can uh, download the data. The system is built to be scalable and also deployable outside PCMWF, but all the complexity of the system is hidden from the user. For them, it's just a web, a web API. Thank you. Thank you so, thank you so much, uh, uh, Milana. If, uh, is there any question from the audience? So we can uh, open it up. Otherwise, uh, I can come up with a question. Can you hear me, Milana? Yes. Hello. Hi. Uh, well, very nice talk. Thank you so much. And uh, le let me ask maybe a naive question because I'm not a particular of the field, but uh, I also work with uh, computational simulation. So I suspect that the work that you're doing basically implement a huge amount of data. And so you basically run a very, you know, a uh, great amount of simulation. Did you guys partner with anyone like doing a parallel computing or, or you just don't need it? Uh, well, we have our own HPC, so we are running everything there. But okay. we are part of many European projects where we cooperate with people and then explore whatever new, new technologies. So, but uh, yes, we are actually running things on other, on other uh, supercomputers. If you, if that is okay, okay. I remember once the ICCS was based in uh, uh, when we when we did it in China. I remember that we visited this facility and they had a very big uh, supercomputer over there. I heard a lot of uh, parallel computing technique. So, okay, good, very good. Thank you so much. Thanks again. Uh, I think that I can try to see if uh, Zoltan is online. Zoltan, can you hear me? Hi, hi, Stefano. Yes, I am online. Stefano, hi. sorry. Uh, there are two questions to Milana. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I didn't see them. Sorry, sorry. I didn't see them either. Okay, so I'm gonna re I'm gonna read them for you. Thank you for uh, for whoever make me notice this. So uh, we have uh, one question uh, from uh, uh, Lorenz Wien. Uh, if you can comment on your plans for a uh, computer to data, so how will uh, that be implemented? Uh, if you have any concrete uh, technology in mind. So we are building a private cloud for that, which will be uh, together with Umetsat. So the users will be able to access both uh, satellite data and our data, and then they will be the data will be uh, pushed there right away. Okay, so, thank you. Uh, let me ask you the second question, which is from uh, uh, Anton Lebedev. Uh, has there been any consideration to reduce the amount of data rather than to try and push petabytes to users to have them to do something with it? So specifically reduction of the data set to minimal subsets. Uh, 
Yes, every user can actually specify what they want to get. So they are not getting everything. Every user has their own dissemination or uh, archive request where they can use only a subset from the data. So no user is actually downloading everything. We are not, but we will push uh, uh, everything to the cloud and then from there users can uh, select what they, what they need. But we are okay. also processing some, some data so users can get some process data too especially the ensemble. Okay, I think we can uh, uh, continue the discussion on the question uh, and uh, answer section. So uh, Milana, thanks again for, uh, for your talk. I do apologize to who asked the question for not seeing them, I'll pay more attention. So um, moving forward, I think I understood that Zoltan is online, yes? Yes, yes I okay. am. Uh, okay, so you're uh, are you are you able to share your screen? Yes. Okay, perfect. So let me introduce uh, the last speaker of this session, which is uh, Zoltan Horvat. I will never be able to pronounce the name of your university. I'm sorry. It's from no problem. Yes, Nistvan University in Hungary. Yes, excellent. Okay, perfect. So he's going to talk about improving the accuracy of a multi-scale model of air pollution. Uh, looking forward to your talk. Thank, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Stefano, for the introduction. Uh, in my talk, uh, uh, first I will talk about the challenge of uh, urban air, air pollution. Uh, then I will go through uh, our, uh, I will give an overview of our uh, pilot in, in the Hidago project, uh, of which you have heard about it. Uh, and I will concentrate on, uh, on a topic of this urban air pollution, which might be a more interest, uh, of most interest uh, of the of the participants, uh, the multi scale and uh, and the uncertainty quantification features uh, of our project. Uh, so the urban air pollution is a is a uh, very dangerous uh, for the for the health, uh, as as is reported by WHO and other organizations that three million deaths. Uh, are attributable to amb uh, ambient air pollution per year. Uh, this is a computed uh, number, uh, but, uh, but uh, a lot of uh, cities are clearly uh, uh, affected seriously by air pollution. And one of the main source uh, of the air pollution is the traffic. Uh, and there were uh, many uh, protests against uh, traffic, uh, traffic uh, organizations uh, for uh, for getting better uh, air in cities. Uh, also, uh, the COVID uh, the COVID situation changed uh, the air pollution uh, of uh, the status of air, air pollution of many cities. Uh, and uh, and the research group in Yale at Yale University uh, proved uh, scientifically uh, that uh, that uh, the better air uh, quality prevented uh, more lives uh, than uh, than uh, the number of lives that, that were killed by, by the COVID. So uh, any, anyway, uh, the air pollution is very important uh, to, uh, uh, to reduce uh, and uh, provide cities uh, with better air. The European, uh, the European Commission regulates the air quality management and, uh, and provides uh, uh, with some uh, interfaces with uh, with the from the Copernicus project, uh, air quality uh, forecasts uh, uh, through a website. But for each city, there is only one one number uh, for every three year, three hours. So one city is one number. Uh, but if we go through uh, into details uh, with a detailed computational simulation, then we can see that there are hotspots in the cities. Uh, there are some parts of the city uh, which are uh, where the pollution is very high. Uh, however, uh, the general or the average uh, can be average. Uh, so in, in the one number, uh, one number chart, uh, we have a nice situation. Uh, however, uh, at certain places, uh, for, for the half of the time of the, of the day, uh, the, the uh, concentration of the nit nitrogen oxide uh, of which we simulated is, is larger than uh, than the the has uh, uh, that the has uh, barrier. 
So uh, there is a need uh, of, uh, of high performance computing uh, to provide better uh, information uh, on the air pollution uh, in, the, in a city. Uh, this, is our, this is the overview of our workflow in the, in the Hidalgo project. So we collect data, uh, a lot of data uh, from traffic monitoring, uh, from weather services that Milana has just, uh, just uh, 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 talked about uh, with the polytope. Uh, we have also uh, uh, climate, uh, climate data from the Copernicus services that we couple. Uh, and also uh, from local measurements on, of a city. Uh, then after the pre-processing of the simulations, uh, we simulate the traffic, uh, calculate the emission, uh, and then go to the computational fluid dynamic simulation uh, for the air pollution uh, and the pollutant dispersion uh, in, the, in the air. And then uh, we post-process our data. Uh, uh, to, to show you some pictures uh, about this, uh, we can show you that a full city, city of Győr, Hungary, uh, of 130,000 uh, people uh, as habitants. Uh, this is a, a medium city. Uh, we, we made a, a computational model of the 3D model uh, of the city uh, and then computed uh, the, uh, the mesh, both meshes, uh, mesh for the airflow simulation and mesh for the uh, for the uh, traffic simulation. Uh, we have some very nice videos uh, to show uh, impressive videos uh, of, of, of full cities, uh, which are uh, discretized uh, by uh, tetrahedral and other meshes. Uh, the data coupling, the, the one uh, important tool is the ECMW app uh, polytope uh, for, uh, for the data. And the other tool uh, for data that we couple is from the measurement of the, of the traffic. Uh, you can see here a camera system, uh, the plans of a camera system that will be a, in this uh, autumn uh, implemented in the city uh, to gather uh, traffic data very uh, accurately. So we couple uh, during the simulation, this kind of data, the weather data and the traffic data, weather data for the CFD, and traffic data to the SUMO traffic simulation. Uh, we can see the scalability is, uh, uh, is pretty nice uh, with, with the open form software. Uh, and the, the simulation uh, shows uh, uh, interesting uh, results. Uh, uh, perhaps uh, we can have a look at, uh, at the, one of the simulations. Here we have a YouTube uh, uh, channel uh, for those. Uh, and uh, uh, we can see uh, these, uh, these simulations from here. Uh, this is a simulation overview uh, from above uh, to Graz. Uh, and uh, and uh, uh, going back to the uh, main uh, presentation, uh, we can see uh, the scalability in numbers. So the, the higher the mesh, the better the scalability as we expected. And even for Stuttgart, we have results. Uh, from a web interface, uh, we, get, we can get the results uh, very nicely uh, for providing easy access to, to the results. Now turning to, to uh, uh, a little bit more details uh, to, the, uh, to the uncertainty quantification, uh, th these are the Navier Stokes equation that we saw with open form and ANSYS fluent. Uh, these are uh, the four equations are the incompressible uh, urine simulations for, uh, for, uh, for inco incompressible fluids uh, with, with the Navier Stokes equations. And uh, nitrogen oxide pollution is calculated as a, uh, as an, with an additional term uh, where uh, U uh, is coming from the Navier Stokes equation, the, uh, the wind velocity, the local wind velocity. And uh, solving these equations, uh, we can see uh, that uh, uh, and coupling uh, the SUMO simulation, uh, we can get uh, the results uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, in the full uh, 3D geometry. Uh, the data uh, for the coupling, uh, you know, uh, is, is pretty coarse mesh uh, on which we get uh, the results from 
ECMWF because this is a, a global and uh, these are coming from a global simulation that is 10 kilometer by 10 kilometer grid on which we get the wind data. Uh, and this, this green uh, small area is just the, the, the neighborhood of city of Dior on which we simulate. So uh, we cut the data uh, from the global simulation uh, and now uh, we take the closest point uh, to our simulation domain from the weather simulation and we impose boundary conditions on our CFD uh, simulation model to the boundary uh, from the ECMWF data and, and we compute uh, uh, and we use that as boundary conditions. For ensemble forecasting, we use uh, for the uncertainty quantification ensemble forecasting. Uh, so uh, we would like to get uh, uh, from the weather, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the ensemble model for the weather. If we get the ensemble model uh, for the weather, uh, because ECMWF computes uh, uh, also uh, the uh, not only one value, but, but actually an ensemble for uncertainty quantification. If we use those values, uh, then uh, we perturb uh, the base simulation uh, for, from the base uh, wind uh, boundary data. Uh, if not, uh, then we perturb ourselves uh, the boundary wind uh, data uh, and with the noise and we compute a, a set of, uh, of simulations from perturbed data. And, uh, and when we have the, uh, the measurement uh, from, uh, from certified measurement points, uh, then we compare uh, with, the, uh, so -called, with the continuous rank probability score, uh, our simulation data uh, to, the, uh, to the measurement. And- so, uh, uh, Five more minutes. Thank you, uh, that's enough, thank you. Uh, and uh, here you are, uh, some results, some actual results of our uh, very recent cal calculations. Uh, here you can see uh, that we have here, uh, maybe you can see the red uh, dots uh, here. These are the measurements. Uh, these are the measurements uh, uh, in the city of Dior, uh, the certified point. And uh, you can see uh, we didn't draw uh, all the uh, graphs of the of the simulated data uh, here uh, on the horizontal axis we have the time and on the vertical axis we can see the nox concentration and we, we can see here the uh, the second uh, smallest and and this is the uh, the second largest uh, element uh, uh, of the from the simulations and we can see that the uh, that the measurements are uh, very well covered uh, by the perturbed simulations. Uh, the median uh, of the, of the 10, uh, uh, 10 uh, simulations, our ensemble uh, consists of one base and 10 uh, ensemble uh, perturbed simulations. Uh, we can see that the median uh, is, a, is a pretty good estimate uh, of, the, of, the measured, uh, of the measurements. And uh, we computed also the CRPS uh, value. In the, in the next future, uh, uh, we plan, and it's already partially implemented, uh, that the uh, ensembles uh, will be computed by a model order reduction technology, uh, which is an AI big data combined with, with HPC simulations. Uh, and, uh, and with that, uh, we can get a very accurate, uh, pretty accurate result uh, and but but pretty pretty fast uh, and uh, and we will compute uh, 50 uh, 50 part of solutions with model order reductions and uh, this will uh, be uh, done operation in operation uh, this year thank you very much for your attention thank you so much uh, uh Zoltan. thanks for your nice talk uh so i think there is no open question yet so i'll ask you a couple of questions uh well one is more technical uh, so you basically used uh, a different cfd solver right for the different right. uh, uh sub packages of your work uh is there any rationality that brought you to choose one solver rather than the other uh, not yet. Uh, we would like to provide it as a service for, for policymakers. 
and it will be de it will depend on the policymakers' availability of, on the software uh, to which uh, the policymaker has availability. Uh, OpenFOAM is an open source software. Ansys Fluent is a very robust, very nice code, uh, and uh, but it it has to pay, uh, but but user has to pay for that. Yeah. So, uh, it, it, it is a modular framework. I didn't stress it. That, so our framework is modular. So if you have a particular solver uh, for CFD or for traffic, you can put it uh, with standardized data. So it's easy to put it there. We have a, we have a question from uh, Mikhail Kulczewski. So um, do you take in account, for example, emission that comes from road traffic or do you sample only input from weather data? No, uh, the, the emission you mean? Uh, yes, the, uh, for the emission, uh, we take into account the, the traffic emission fully the traffic emission. This is why we have been implementing uh, camera sensor network uh, for that. Now we have been using loop data, induction loop data. Uh, and uh, from that, uh, we compute uh, the traffic. Uh, and with the Copert model, we calculate the emission. OK, we have uh, one last question. And uh, it's, uh, what is the computational cost for the CFD simulation for street level? It depends uh, on, on which resolution we want to go. Uh, if we go to four meter resolution at street, uh, then we need uh, to use uh, for a four kilometer by four kilometer by one kilometer city, uh, something like 1.5 million cells. And uh, one day, a uh, simulation of one day costs uh, three, four hours on, on 400 cores. Uh, this is the this is one of the uh, goal of the Hidago project uh, that uh, to use the expertise uh, of the HPC experts uh, in the data centers uh, to bring it scalable to uh, to bigger uh, machines. Okay, uh, well, I, I encourage everyone to keep up the discussion on the question and answer section. Uh, I think that, uh, well, thank, thanks again, Zoltan, for your talk. I think that this was the last talk for this session. Maybe, Hugo, you can correct me if I'm mistaken. Correct. Um, so we're going to break now and actually uh, reconvene at 4.10 Central European time or 3.10 in the UK. So it's actually quite a substantial break we're faced with now. So everyone can really take their time making their coffees. Um, yeah, uh, so could I also ask that the, the speakers in the chair for the next session, please stay online. Uh, you can feel free to go make a coffee, but please stay on the call and I can set your privileges appropriately for the next session. All right, thank you. All right, that's it. Let's break. Okay, so welcome back everyone from the coffee break. Um, normally I would now ring the bell and walk along the coffee halls um, to tell you that we are getting started now. Um, so we just do it virtually uh, this time. So thanks again for joining this last session of this nice um, digital version of our uh, workshop. My name is Philipp Neumann. I'm professor for high performance computing at Helmut Schmidt University at Hamburg. And I'm very happy to uh, chair this last session. The first talk in our session will be given by Benjamin Chacha. I hope I pronounced it correctly. Um, on a heterogeneous multi-scale model for blood flow. Looking forward to your talk and then um, looking forward to the questions and answers round. Um, for those of you who have just joined, I just wanted to remind you that if you want to pose a question after the talk, um, simply look in Zoom into the uh, bottom line of buttons. Um, there's a Q&A button where you can just um, write uh, and uh, post your, your question. I will then read it to the speaker. All right, so um, thanks for joining and let's get started with the talk. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Benjamin Chaya. I'm a PhD student in the group of Gabor Zavodsky and Alphonse Hoekstra at the University of Amsterdam. And today I'll be talking about one of my projects, which is a heterogeneous multi-scale model for blood flow. Um, I'm sorry that we couldn't be together uh, for this conference, so I please encourage anybody to have any uh, that has any questions to uh, uh, 
uh, contact me or you know feel free to uh, approach me at a future conference if if we happen to be at the same conference. So I want to begin this work uh, by starting with the motivation, and that is um, to develop a uh, um, blood flow model that is physiologically relevant across multiple scales of the human body. So here you see is a typical uh, scale time separation map um, of uh, numerical models typically employed, employed to solve blood flow in the human body. Um, and uh, my main focus of this will be to take um, the cell resolved model um, in 3D which solves the non-Newtonian behavior of whole blood and raise it to, to uh, scales that are not achievable um, with cell-resolved models. So raise it to larger millimeter or centimeter scales. So the goal number one will be to make it computationally cost-effective. Basically, it needs to be cheaper um, than running the full-blown cell-resolved model over the entire uh, simulation domain, and it must be physically accurate. So I want to start off with the cell-resolved model that we use, and we use and develop at the University of Amsterdam HemoCell. Um, and with that, we're able to reproduce the non-Newtonian effect of the Fahrenheit's Linquist effect, which is the decrease of the uh, uh, bulk uh, viscosity as um, uh, vessel diameter decreases, um, uh, a plug flow profile, so the departure of the Newtonian Poissile uh, flow profile, and the existence of a red blood cell free layer. So the red blood cell free layer really is uh, hand in hand with the uh, Fahrenheit's Linquist effect. Now the cost of running such a method um, is that with one red blood cell, we have uh, 642 Lagrangian points that make up um, our red blood cell that are communicating with the uh, lattice Boltzmann fluid. Um, we need to solve approximately 4,000 uh, equations per cell per time step. So if we want to simulate a bulk flow simulation with a phy physiological relevant hematocrit for um, a physical second, it will take us approximately 10 days over 250 compute cores. So the idea of bringing this beyond the micro scale, so what I'm showing here is um, uh, a tube of 100 microns in diameter. If we want to bring that to the millimeter or even centimeter scale, um, uh, we're going to need um, a, some sort of multi-scale method to uh, uh, do this. Now what I want to outline you is the heterogeneous multi-scale method. So heterogeneous here means that um, uh, we have multiple models that make up our, our, our entire model, and those models can be different. Basically, they don't have to be homogeneous, they're heterogeneous. So whatever type of physical process we want to model, we pick that model and then stick it in um, into our entire HMM uh, model. So what I want to start here is on the macro scale. On the macro scale we'll use a lattice Boltzmann fluid solver to solve the momentum and velocity of the fluid um, and with that it will be coupled to an advection diffusion solver also using lattice Boltzmann on the macro scale and that will uh, solve the um, concentrations of the red blood cells on the matter, uh, macro scale. Now, these two solvers will be informed by the micro scale. So at each location on the macro scale, or maybe at sparse locations, we'll open up uh, smaller uh, micro scale simulations and run cell resolved simulations. So we'll simulate per local shear rate and concentration on the macro scale, um, uh, micro scale simulations and measure a dynamic viscosity and a diffusion coefficient, which will then later be returned back up to the macro scale and to start the whole process over again. So we will have on the macro scale a continuous fluid which is informed by the cell nature of whole blood. 
Now the scale separation here, um, the lattice spacing we'll choose for the macro scale will be about 10 microns and the lattice spacing on the micro scale will be about half a micron. So it's really kind of just an order of magnitude difference, um, which is quite conservative, but I would like to start conservatively um, to make sure things are physically accurate on the macro scale and then um, uh, see uh, how sparse we can make the, um, the, uh, the lattice spacing on the macro scale in order to be uh, physiologically relevant. So let's start on the micro scale. Um, what we need to do is we need to create simulations that um, are uniform in shear and uh, do not have wall effects. So the way of doing this is, is opening up what's called a Lee's Edwards simulation. So here you have a special simulation domain that allows you to create a uniform sheared environment, uh, be periodic in all directions, and which will not introduce uh, any wall effects. So here you see um, the velocity error of a single red blood cell crossing um, the boundary layer and the velocity error that it introduces into the simulation domain. So here you see our method compared to other methods in literature that um, is, our method is in blue and orange and it introduces uh, at least it's competitive with uh, other relevant uh, errors, um, other relevant uh, methods in uh, the current uh, uh... <laughs> I apologize uh, for the audio of this recording. Someone just rang my doorbell and I do not want to start this recording all over again. So it will be a bit jumbled at the moment. I'm going to drop back in a couple of slides. Um, uh, so basically, starting from here, we have uh, good behavior of a particle crossing the boundary of a red blood cell. And what this allows us to do is uh, create a um, multi-cell uh, suspension uniform sheared uh, environment. So this was implemented from a master student in our group, Dan Van Ingen, which um, was a very uh, successful project. This is quite a quite a feat for a, a seventh month uh, project. And we're, so, what this allows us to do is calculate uh, dynamic viscosity of uh, suspension of red blood cells. So, what what we can do is we can um, stimulate for multiple combinations of shear rates and hematocrits. Um, we can uh, match our uh, uh, our simulations to what are called Chen curves. So here is, uh, in black is shown the shear thinning behavior of whole blood that when you increase the shear rates uh, of a suspension of whole blood you will decrease the uh, viscosity of whole blood. Now on the micro scale we can op open up uh, many different combinations of shear rates and hematocrit combinations and measure um, a, a dynamic viscosity and also a diffusion coefficient. Um, from that, we can simply fit a, uh, a two-dimensional polynomial using least, the least squares and get um, an idea of, of how these phase spaces are um, uh, uh, from which we can interpolate a uh, dynamic viscosity and a uh, diffusion coefficient. So what we want to do is we want to raise that information back up to the macro scale and we have our HMM model. So the current progress, here you see on the macro scale our fluid on the left and our hematocrit on the right. This is for a simulation of a rectangular chamber of 200, oh, that's a typo, it's 200 microns, um, which is informed at each lattice spacing on the macro scale from the cell resolved micro scale. What we're able to produce on the macro, on the micro scale in terms of physiologically valid, uh, being uh, physiologically relevant is um, the Chien curves, which I highlighted, but when we look at the macro scale, we can uh, examine the velocity profile and the hematocrit profile 
um, in our HMM model. Now the major goal here is to reproduce uh, the fahrenheit linquist effect with our HMM model. Now what I'm showing you is current results as of this week. I, in the spirit of this being a workshop and to promote questions, I'm a bit, uh, I would, I really would like to hear your feedback, but what we can see is with 20% hematocrits, um, we seem to be following this trend quite well, but when we uh, go for higher hematocrits on the macro scale, um, we do see a shear thinning behavior as vessel diameter decreases, um, but it does not follow the fahrenheit linquist curves, the theoretical curves perfectly just yet. So there still is uh, work to be done. And in terms of other work, um, these models need to be connected in a, a, a smarter way. Um, so we, we tend to do that with muscle three. Uh, we want to do multi-core implementation on the micro scale. So these Lee's Edwards simulations are currently single, uh, single uh, threaded simulations. And um, hopefully we can also develop a surrogate model for the micro scale so that we don't have to keep opening up these Lee's Edwards boxes. Um, the idea of this being a heterogeneous multi-scale model is that it can be extended to include other phenomena like thrombosis, uh, stenting, and thrombolysis. So we will start from the rheology, the core rheology. Once we have that, we can start building on it um, to uh, simulate more physiological relevant uh, questions. So I thank everyone for their time and uh, I look forward to hearing your uh, questions. Thank you very much. So thanks a lot for the talk. Um, I see already that there are quite some questions that are there. Um, so let's get started with the first one. The first one is given by um, Stefano. He is asking, have you thought about studying red blood cells injury? It's fantastic you have a single cell resolution. If you think about vascular and valvulo pathologies, the loss of energies that blood flow experiences from obstructed flow typically alter shear stress um, that damages the erythrocytes, um, but also hemolysis is a huge clinical problem. So can you comment on that? Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, there's, there's most definitely a lot of, um, <clears throat> let's say, pathophysiologically uh, applications for the cell result uh, uh, software that we have. Um, I think in terms of what you explicitly uh, wrote here, we haven't um, researched, but in my own research as a PhD student, I have had projects studying the, the effects due to the stiffening of red blood cells, which is uh, apparent in diabetes and sickle cell anemia. So um, again, I think you, if you're talking about stenosis and restenosis, um, from my understanding that happens I'm sure it happens on a lot of scales, but I'm really familiar with um, it happening on larger vessel scales. So it's unachievable by a cell result uh, model. Um, but if you think about um, diseases, for instance, um, uh, uh, microaneurysms that happen in your eyes, um, they, those uh, happen in diabetes, and those may be affected um, also because of shear stress, because I do think that endothelial cells um, are, are uh, sensitive in that disease. So I, I know that was quite a long-winded answer, but I, I hope, uh, yeah, please uh, email us if, if you want uh, to elaborate more on the, the application of hemo cell. Great, thanks. Um, and then there's uh, one more question from uh, John McCullough, I hope I pronounced it correctly. Um, could the increased hematocrit be changing the effective width of your domain, shifting the data points to the left on FL curve? <laughs> this is a great question. And I, I actually probably shouldn't have included that slide in this presentation <laughs> because it is a developing model. Um, so yes, it, 
the, the, the problem seems to be occurring when we're pushing this HMM model to small scales. I mean, so you, you need to validate this large scale model somehow um, in terms of how does it behave uh, uh, with handling non-Newtonian blood. Um, but the, all the, um, the non-Newtonian effects happen on the micro scale or on the higher shear rate scales. So it's, yeah, it's a trade-off. So at, 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 we're trying to build this model to go up in scale, but we have to validate it on things that are probably too small for the scale. So yeah, it probably most definitely is what I'm showing in that last uh, FL curve that the densities are not behaving properly on the smaller scales and that could be due to the lattice spacing of the macro scale. It might be too large. Um, so we, yeah, we get finite uh, uh, grid effects that we're not properly resolving the cell-free layer on the macro scale. Perfect, thanks. Um, and I would have uh, one more question, um, which is on slide number five that you presented, which was on the performance numbers. So you said that based on the assumptions here, you would need like 10 days on 250 cores for your problem. Um, uh, how do you, did you extrapolate that? So was this coming from the actual performance of your current code and how, how much is your code already tuned? So how close to the actual peak performance in terms of memory bandwidth, which probably is the most problem um, are you with your code? Yeah, so what the, the numbers I reported were from uh, a one, like a, a, a um, actual case, a simulated physical second of a 100 micron diameter tube. Um, in terms of scalability, I think that it can most definitely be scaled further. I mean, this was an application case. Um, I know there are current efforts uh, in our group to start putting uh, the different components on different types of processors. So for instance, putting the cells or the fluid on a GPU, for instance. So it, it definitely can require, um, I, it definitely can have more development in terms of high performance computing. Okay, great, thanks. So as there are no more questions and it's time to move on anyway, um, I'd say thanks again a lot for this presentation, um, Ben. Thank um, you. And let's go for the next um, talk in this round. So the next talk will be given by Gabor Chavotsky. I hope I got that one right. <laughs> um, and the talk is about a statistical mean field model for bridging the scale gap between cell result and continual blood flow mechanics. So let's stay with blood. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Gabor Zawodzki, and I'm an assistant professor at the Computational Science Lab in Amsterdam. In the following, I'm going to talk about a statistically coarse grain model with the aim of being able to couple the cellular microscopic level simulations towards the continuum 3D macroscopic level simulations. When we talk about blood flow simulations, what we typically mean is some sort of uh, a detailed 3D simulation, which uh, I will refer to here as macroscopic level. The typical scale of it is a few centimeters, and for boundary conditions, we often couple it to lower detail, but larger scale models, such as a full body one dimensional uh, network. And the information exchange between them is typically some sort of an average value. For example, uh, we can exchange pressure, but also uh, flow rate, which can be regarded as uh, average velocity values. However, towards the cellular scale, the picture is not that clear. Uh, we retain at the moment very little information. For example, the overall rheology for which we can use non-Newtonian non models, such as this Karayasuda model to retain the fundamentally cellular property shear thinning here, which arises from the deformability of red blood cells. In order to improve this situation, we would like to find a way how to retain more information from the cellular level. The central question of this talk is how to create this information exchange between the macroscopic level calculations 
and cellular calculations because it would provide a way to include cellular effects in the macroscopic scale simulations such as effects on rheology for example. It would also create a way to include more biological processes because these processes inherently happen on the cellular scale and therefore require explicitly multi-scale applications. Finally, um, this information exchange method would provide a way obviously to couple these, fully couple these two scales for example, by uh, creating a two-way boundary condition between them. If you would like to hear a bit more about this idea, then please look up the talk of my colleague Ben Chaya, who was presenting on this. Apart from the shear sending behavior, there are various other cellular processes that uh, act in the cellular suspension and they influence both rheology and both transport properties of whole blood. In order to explain how to transfer this information from the cellular level towards the macroscopic scale, first I need to explain what information is available to us, what we can do on the cellular level. Our central tool for this is HemoCell, which is an open source code that we've been using for a few years now. And it is thoroughly validated both against single cell mechanical experiments and complete blood flow setup experiments. While uh, <coughs> this mechanical model of the cells that we use in HemoCell is, of course, physics motivated. It does contain a handful of parameters in order of four or five. And if you would like to learn a little bit about how we carried out sensitivity analysis and uncertainty quantification on this model, please look up the presentation of my other colleague, Anna Nikishova. She, together with Kevin De Vries, carried out a detailed analysis on this. So the basic idea of uh, this interface between the two scales is quite similar to the idea of, of communication between the macroscopic and the full body scale, where the information exchange is based on some averaging of, uh, of the values. Here I would like to explain what values uh, are we extracting and how. When we go to the cellular level, we recreated an experimental setup that you can see on the top right, which is a straight channel of blood flow. And uh, in the experimental setup from this blood flow by tracking red blood cells, the authors extracted trajectories or parts of trajectories for cells. And from that, they could extract cell diffusivities. Of course, in the simulation, we have access to much higher detail of uh, of trajectories, of cell collisions, of, of uh, the state of the cells. So we carried out a similar investigation. However, we varied the parameters in a much wider range. We changed the diameter, the hematocrit, and uh, the overall flow rate of uh, the simulation. And of course, uh, at those parameters which matched the, the experiments, we validated the results. And um, our values are within 10% of the experimental values. However, the extracted values are relatively noisy, so we had to do spatial averaging as well. The values of interest, first and foremost, were hematocrit, local shear rate, the local shear induced diffusivity, and radial velocity of the cells. Now, to be able to average them uh, to reduce the noise, we created these colorful zones, which are axial layers, and um, we assume that all these parameters are constant with these, these layers and uh, we chose the width of these uh, zones to correspond to the diameter of a red blood cell. From all these recorded values we can uh, model some of the cellular properties and uh, can transfer their effect towards the macroscopic scale. However, first we need to choose which cellular processes to take into account. For this investigation, we selected the effect of cell-cell collisions, that is, the shear-induced diffusivity, which is one of the most influential effects on rheology. We also included the wall-induced wall lift force, and also the margination effect of the hematocrit gradient, because that is important if we would like to add additional cell types like platelets, white blood cells, and so on. Uh, in order to represent these in a macroscopic simulation, we present these 
cell concentrations as a, a scalar field coupled with the macroscopic fluid. So you can imagine it as a, as a field of concentration, a scalar field of concentration that's coupled to the fluid, so it follows the flow of the macroscopic fluid. However, this is not a passive scalar field. There is an additional advection diffusion type equation acting on it, and the dynamics from uh, the cellular field is represented through processes that are included in this advection diffusion type equation. So for example, a parameter like diffusivity can contain the cellular level shear induced diffusivity. A way to include shear induced diffusivity on the macroscopic level is to model the effects of the cell collisions. We can take the widely known model for hard spheres and extend it by allowing the cells to deform. That means that the characteristic size A is now a function of shear rate according to the function presented on the right side. The dependence of the red blood cell radius on the shear rate, this function, can be extracted either from detailed simulation or recorded from experimental measurements. Using this model, we can reconstruct the local cellular diffusivities from the local hematocrit and uh, shear rate values. And if we compare it to the detailed simulations, the agreement is quite good for red blood cells. And of course, the same model works for heterogeneous collisions as well. Therefore, we can look at collisions between red blood cells and platelets. These are the diffusivities for platelets. And on the left, I also plotted the well-known Zidney Colton model uh, for comparison. Other macroscopic parameters, such as the local viscosity, can be gained in a similar fashion. Here we use the bachelor green formula that is meant for hard sphere suspensions, but we extended it by allowing the red blood cells to deform and change the radii following exactly the same shear rate dependence as before. On the left, we compare the local viscosities of this model to the values from the detailed simulation, and we have a really good agreement. This leads to a viscosity function, which describes rheology a bit more accurately, since it's no longer only a function of the shear rate, but also of the hematocrit. You can see this mapped out on the left, and if we take a horizontal slice, which corresponds to 45% hematocrit, and plot it separately, you can see that it reproduces the shear thinning behavior at a given hematocrit level nicely. And uh, this corresponds to the curvature of the model. However, since uh, we are including really uh, strong simplifications, such as we do not have any cell aggregation mechanics, no rule of formation whatsoever, we only take into account cell pair collisions, which is not true for high hematocrit. There are no lubrication effects or plasma strain hardening effects due to the presence of large suspended proteins. This all results in the fact that if you see this rheologic curve, we missed uh, the high going values and the plateauing at the really low shear rates. However, I also have to note that even with these simplifications, we used a minimal amount of fitted constants uh, for viscosity and for all the other models that we included. For example, in this particular case, there are zero fitted uh, constants. We use this uh, bachelor green function as is with no additional constants anywhere. These model components together form the following model where the centerpieces uh, an advection diffusion type equation, one for every cell type. As you remember, I've mentioned that these are actually represented towards the macroscopic simulation as concentration fields. Here we have one concentration field with one advection diffusion equation, equation for each cell type. These advection diffusion equations are then containing parameters for uh, the velocity, for the advection, and also for the diffusive parts. And these parameters are informed by the models that we've just discussed. For example, the diffusivity contains the shear induced dispersion, the shear induced diffusivity of cells, while the velocity component contains the lift velocity induced by the shear and the, the presence of the wall. From these, we can calculate the local hematocrit distribution, which is then fed to the bachelor green formula, which translates it using local shear rates and local hematocrits to create effective hematocrits. It will turn it into local viscosity values, which is then added 
to the flow solver. An iteration of the flow solver afterwards then informs our advection diffusion models in multiple ways. For once, it's, it carries these fields with it, and it also yields local shear rates values that will inform these submodels how to compute cell deformation and how to compute again cell diffusivities, lift force, and so on. And finally, a result from a macroscopic model coupled to the statistical core screen model, real model. On the left side, a quick comparison between the radial distribution of hematocrit in a straight pipe. You can see that there is a good match, however, the computational time required compared to the detailed cellular simulation widely differs. On the right side, you can see priest curves, which uh, show the apparent relative viscosity of blood as it flows through a straight glass tube. This is a typical cellular effect that as we go down with the diameter, the viscosity drops because the cell-free layer size, in effect, is larger and larger compared to the diameter of the vessel, of the glass tube. Until the point when it reaches about 8 micron, which is the diameter of a red blood cell, at which point it gets more and more difficult to squeeze blood through. You can see that the data points computed with a macroscopic flow coupled with real model fit really well on top of the priest curves, which show that there has to be cellular level information in the modeling, and the results are accurate up to a millimeter or so, at which point the general assumptions that we used to build up this model no longer hold really well. To sum it up, the model can be used to resolve rheology, including effects from the cellular scale, as demonstrated by the reproduction of priest curves using a macroscopic flow. And it can also be used to generate boundary conditions for coupling with a fully cellular simulation where the knowledge of the cellular concentrations are necessary on the boundary. And uh, in the future, it will be extended to include additional cell types and chemical fields in order to realize biological coupling on the macroscopic level. And uh, with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. And I would also like to thank the organizers for bringing this nice meeting online. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Great. So thanks a lot for this uh, talk and this recording. Um, so are there any questions from the audience? Um, as some might still be typing, there's currently no other open question. I have several on my list. Um, the first one that I would have is, um, you presented the um, discretization of your tube-like geometry at the beginning, where you discretized it in um, different um, yeah, bins, so sort to of speak, or different shells. Um, as I understood, these shells had more or less the same size or the same thicknesses. Um, did you think about making this more adaptive to make the approximations even better? Because it seemed to me that if you look at uh, bigger distances from the center, so a bigger radius, that then the, the approximations became a little bit worse, right? Or did I misinterpret that? No, you, you see that perfectly. So uh, what we kept constant is the width of these layers, which means yeah. that since we have a tube, as you go close to the wall, you will have larger volumes included. So the statistics close to the wall should be better based on, on a spatial averaging. However, there was uh, one constraint on this situation that uh, we wanted to create zones that only include around red blood cell width or so. Otherwise, uh, we could also average over behaviors that we want to keep separate. So that's the reason why we fixed the width at, at red blood cell size and kept that constant. I see, all right, good. Um, there's one more question now from Serge Gias. Um, is there feedback from micro to macro scale or one-way modeling, question mark? Yeah, this is a quite important question, I think. And uh, the answer is yes, there is two-way information. Uh, on one way, the cellular model or the information from the cellular level eventually defines the local viscosities for the macro scale. And then the macro scale solves the fluid flow, which yields back shear rates towards the, the micro scale model, since the whole information gathering from the microscopic scale based on the deformability of the red blood cells, we need to know the local shear rates. And that is what is communicated back uh, during this coupling. 
And of course, if we go to something much more complicated that works not only in a straight pipe as this one, uh, but in, in general geometries that you've been hearing from Ben Chaya previously, then uh, we need to couple actual microscopic simulations as well, where you need to give it um, some boundary condition, for example, density of, of red blood cells, local hematocrit. And this intermediate layer that I explained here basically does that. It doesn't know about the actual cells, but it can yield uh, a local hematocrit value that you can use to couple an even more detailed microscopic model in. Great, thanks a lot for this detailed um, information. So as there are no more questions at the moment um, from um, the audience and from my side, I think we can continue with the next talk. Um, and we will now jump away from um, bleeding and go to uh, breathing. Um, so we will now talk about urban air modeling air quality over complex urban areas. And the talk will be given by Mikhail Kulczewski. Looking forward to this um, recording. Good afternoon. My name is Mia Kulczewski. I'm working at Poznan Supercomputing and Networking Center. And today with my colleagues, I have a great pleasure to present you the urban air multiscale application that deals with assessing air quality in urban areas. The reason for the study is that here in Poland, we have one of the worst air quality in Europe. We particularly suffer during the winter season uh, because of the high particulate matter concentration, which are mainly attributed to the poor domestic heat appliances. Particulate matter as well as nitrous dioxide is said to be uh, the cause of many diseases, including problems with lungs or heart, which later leads to premature deaths. This is why we focus on urban areas, where we have a mix of pure heat appliances and higher traffic. The particulate matter and nitrous dioxide pollutants are coming from point sources, like industrial chimneys, from line sources, which are connected mainly with uh, road transportation, and this is the focus of the study, and area sources, which are mainly uh, connected with uh, pure heat appliances. The transport and dispersion of contaminants depends on terrain topography and land cover, but in urban areas, uh, there are additional difficulties because of the densely populated streets, uh, with high number of buildings and complex structures, and all of this needs to be uh, properly tackled. Moreover, there are a lot of uncertainties, such as the lack of the input emission data. So taking the line sources as an example, we can provide statistical data about number of cars that are passing the street uh, within an hour. However, we don't have enough data to state what is the, the, the fuel usage, what is the nitrous dioxide index attributed to different type of fuels, what are the engines and so on. So the question is if and how we can actually model air quality accurately despite the fact of the missing data. Uh, the answer to this is a uh, urban A multi scale model. Uh, it combines uh, mesoscale weather prediction, uh, community prediction model, WARF, this is our acronym for weather research and forecast uh, with OLILAC. Uh, so the WOLF is running at uh, different levels, from country uh, through voivod ship to the city scale. It takes into account topography and the land cover, and it delivers weather prediction as well as air quality uh, to the OILAC as the uh, initial conditions. Uh, so the OILAC model is an all-scale golf flow flowsolver uh, that we used to, to, to run at city district uh, to the city scale, and it uses the immersed boundary method to accurately model the buildings and complex structures in urban areas so that we are able to uh, provide a um, quite good contamination transplant and dispersion uh, modeling. For this study, we are focusing on a Gerbar street. This is uh, a long, narrow street uh, in Poznan, in Poland, with a high number of vehicles during the rush hours. Uh, the street is surrounded by tall and old buildings uh, delivering um, pure heat appliances. So uh, during the winter, uh, the street particularly suffers from high uh, particulate matter concentration, uh, while during, uh, let's say, the, the, the spring and the summer, uh, the pedestrians and the citizens are suffering from high uh, nitrous dioxide concentration coming from uh, the road transportation. So the street is uh, surrounded by uh, uh, high buildings. It creates a form of some corridor 
and the usual one the direction is perpendic perpendicular to the street so blowing up the contaminated lines is quite difficult as you can see in this picture this is a Gabriel street uh, the wind is going uh, in perpendicular direction uh, to the street and the wind is entering the street it's it bounces from uh, from the buildings uh, making some circular motions and in the end the plume of contaminants is uh, pushed towards one side of the streets making it particularly hazardous for the pedestrians but also uh, for the residents of, uh, of those buildings um, as said before there are a number of uncertainties we have to deal with so uh, even if you know number of vehicles that uh, passes the street within an hour we still don't know what uh, are the what is the ratio between gasoline to diesel engines what is the fuel usage uh, whether the engines had hold or cold started and so on uh, and to other this we can play with the ensembles. So the ensembles are the simulations that differs uh, in input parameters. So actually we are running many different simulations with many different parameters. So in the end we can ever average the results uh, or use some weights. Uh, and additionally we can not only some input parameters like the fuel type or uh, fuel density uh, can be sampled but it can also uh, run the simulations with different weather input uh, data so the weather conditions can be assembled as well and moreover we can run uh, sensitivity analysis to select the most important parameters that influences the results most so in the end in the future we can run less number of ensembles to provide accurate results um, in our MATIS-K model, uh, we apply uncertainty quantification the following way. So for the WARF, we are uh, running three different ensembles using different parameterization schemes uh, for which we provide WARF analysis and then the uncertainty quantification is uh, analyzed so that the, the results of this uh, model uh, goes as an input to the OILAC. And for the OILAC model, we again run different ensembles, uh, we sample different input parameters uh, for each of such set we run OILAC analysis and then perform uh, uncertainty quantification analysis so in the result we have uh, let's say a general uh, a, a mean an average result from all over the ensembles taking into account also different weather conditions but for the sake of the study we just focus on the OILAC uh, city uh, scale model. Uh, for running on HPC and for doing the, the analysis, we are using Vecma Toolkit. Um, this Vecma Toolkit consists of the EasyViewQ, which is responsible for uncertain quantification, verification, and validation. Um, so, this is a Python library. And that allows you to, 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 to provide such analysis. And the first step you have to describe the uh, application. Uh, the most important part is, um, is the definition of the input parameters to be sampled. In our case, uh, we are sampling, for example, fuel usage uh, to be in the range between 6 and 12 liters uh, per 100 kilometers. The other parameter is, to, uh, is the diesel to gasoline ratio which would like to be between 0.3 and 0.7. The second step is the sampling. This produces the list of parameter sets, uh, ACA ensembles, and you can use, for example, a uniform distribution of parameter values. The first step is the execution. You can execute on your local machine or on HPC machine. You can execute your application on cloud resources. Uh, the fourth step is to collect the outputs from all of the ensembles and store it in the local database. And the last but not least is the analysis part to perform some statistical analysis. Uh, for running on the HPC environment, we are using um, QCG middleware, which allows us to automate uh, things. So as an HPC application user, I have access to HPC resources and then use QCG client that comes with a command line and also GUI version uh, that simplifies things. So QCG client runs uh, the QCG pilot job, 
which actually is a large task that orchestrates running the, both the ensembles and EasyVVQ sampling and analysis. EasyVVQ is started, it generates samples, the samples are stored on HP3 sources so that each instance of urban error has access to, uh, to its uh, parameter sample set uh, and uh, our application is running on our PSNC cluster uh, which is equipped with uh, 30, almost 33,000 of CPU cores. Uh, when it comes to uh, analyzing the results, first uh, we are providing the average results over the ensembles. So the figure here presents actually the concentration, the nitro dioxide concentration over uh, different heights. Uh, in Garbari Street, the red line represents the mean result over all ensembles, while the bluish area represents the deviation, so the minimum and maximum value um, registered by, uh, by the ensemble simulations. And this actually can, can uh, demonstrate uh, how much um, difference in input parameters can actually influence uh, the concentration. So at the higher altitudes the, the difference is not that significant, but for the lower one, especially for the 4 meters, you can see that the, although the uh, average result is about 27 micrograms, uh, but the minimum value is 15, while the maximum value is 40 micrograms. So, uh, so you can see how changing the input parameters value can actually uh, impact uh, and how much it can impact the overall result. And the second uh, analysis is the sensitivity analysis to see which parameters are the most crucial one, which are influences the final result the most. And for our use case, um, we observe that the, the fuel usage is not that important. Uh, more important is nitro dioxide index attributed to, uh, to different types of engines, also the, the oil density. But the most important one is actually the ratio between diesel engines to uh, gasoline engines. So in the future, we would like to have, um, let's say, more uh, statistical data on how, how, how the ratio between diesel to gasoline engines uh, looks in, uh, in, in real life examples. Uh, we are also providing some uh, advanced visualization for our users. So using Unity 3D, we are able to provide uh, a view uh, from the top of the city. Uh, the bluish and greenish plumes are the nitro dioxide concentration attributed to road transportation. And um, the streamlines uh, represent the wind direction and uh, they are also colored by um, wind velocity. And we are also able to, to provide even more immersive experience for our users. So they, they are entering cave 3D environment to see uh, the contamination from first pers person perspective. Why do we need Exascale? Because more cores brings faster results. Also, we are able to uh, provide larger domain science simulation or greater or simulations with greater resolution, and we are also able to uh, perform more ensembles. Um, as an example, here is the difference between uh, using 1 and 60 nodes and also between 80 and 2000 of ensembles. So for 80 ensembles, the difference is between 250 hours and 16 hours, but if you switch to 2000 ensembles, then the time needed for one node to, 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 to have the results from all the ensembles is more than 600 hours, uh, while for the uh, 60 nodes is uh, less than 400 hours. Of course, <coughs> increasing the, the, the number of nodes uh, brings your competition to happen uh, earlier. However, please mind that having 2000 of ensembles on 60 nodes already demands 800 thousands of cores. And as increasing, uh, as increasing of the simulation domain is concerned, um, please observe that doubling um, each um, of the grid dimension 
uh, results in almost exponential growth of the computational time required to obtain the results. So, of course, we ha can have better results, but this impacts uh, the, the computational time and the uh, number of resources required uh, for this simulation. For the future steps, we would like to study even more input parameters uh, for the urban scale model. We would like to also analyze the impact of different weather conditions. And uh, we are going to apply an uncertainty quantification to the WARF mesoscale level as well. And the last but not least step is to validate and verify uh, the simulation results for different scenarios. This will also be done uh, via the aforementioned VECMA toolkit. So the key message uh, today I would like you to take home is that uh, we have a multi-scale model to improve air quality in urban areas, but the model, this urban air, can be also used to uh, for to support urban planning, uh, to assess some emergency scenarios, to support citizens' health, and also to make some source apportionment studies. Uh, for the EQ modeling, each application or each model is uh, is encouraged to. Uh, to use the EasyVView Q toolkit, which will support you with dealing with the uncertainties. It can improve your results and also allows you to limit the ensembles needed for further studies via the sensitivity analysis. And the last but not least is the QCG middleware, which eases and also automates and orchestrates uh, running the ensembles on HPC or cloud resources. Thank you very much for your attention. If there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them. But in the meantime, please visit the given link under which you can find some advanced visualization of our uh, K3D uh, solution for, for urban air visualization. Thank you very much. So, thanks a lot for this um, very interesting talk. Um, so I've worked quite a while at the German Climate Computing Center, so weather and climate um, applications are also Pretty interesting to me at this stage. Um, so there's one a question from the round here. Are you interested in uncertain weather inputs as well? How could you handle such challenges for uncertainty quantification? This comes from Serge Gias, this question. Um, so yes, indeed. Um, the uncertainty quantification for the weather input parameters will be part of future work and uh, we'll have done it uh, with the WARF model. So uh, we'll try to study different parameterization schemes uh, for the larger model. And once the uncertainty quantification has been done, um, it will input uh, to the OILAC air quality model. Great, thanks. Um, I would have one more question. That is, you had a, a slide on the results, uh, on analyzing the results. And there was some graph on NO2 emission at different heights that you measured, basically. Um, I just wanted to get some more information on what I exactly saw in these graphs. So was this like the NO2 um, emission measured in the corresponding street that you showcased or was it like in the entire city? Well, yes, it was uh, It was for the street, uh, for let's say given, uh, given point in two dimensional space. And on the graph, you, uh, the nitro dioxide concentration was presented at different heights. So uh, with the going with the higher altitudes, uh, the concentration becomes lower, and it was particularly, let's say, bad uh, on at uh, two and the four meters uh, altitude. I see. I see. Good. All right. Um, I would have one more question. Um, you mentioned QCG that you used to uh, manage uh, your entire ensemble of, of simulations or of your your systems. Um, I never used QCG, so can you just briefly say what it is and how it actually works? I would be really interested in that. Um, so basically, uh, QCG is a middleware uh, for HPC centers, uh, so it interacts with uh, underlying uh, job uh, queuing system like Slurm, for example. Uh, and as for the client, you, you you can run your applications using command line or GUI. So uh, so basically, QCG is an orchestrator between the client and between the 
between the job queuing system, but it's quite, let's say, more user friendly, right? Because it can manage not, not only uh, running your jobs, but it can only also manages, um, let's say, uh, staging in and staging out uh, results of your simulation and some notification um, mm -hmm. as well. I see. Well, sounds good. I have to check that one out. Thanks a lot. Um, there's you. one more question um, coming up that was on your nice visualizations. So Serge Gias also asks, can you send the link to the visualization again? Yeah, yeah, sure. I, I, I will put the link in the chat. Perfect. Awesome. So I don't see um, any other questions so far. Or is there? Okay, so if this is not the case, um, then I would say we'll continue um, with the next talk. Um, although we are slightly ahead of time, but I think that's fine. So let's get started with the first, uh, with the uh, last three talks now in the session. Um, one short information here at the stage is um, we'll also have a few closing words at the end of the session um, given by Peter Coveney. So please just um, stay um, in our session. Um, for this official closing of the workshop at the end. All right, good. Um, with that, let's jump to the next talk, which is about formation of morphogenic patterns in cellular automata given by Bhakti Vasiev. So looking forward to your talk. Okay, uh, so this is, thank you for letting me talk here on this workshop. So I will be talking about formation of morph morphogenetic patterns in cellular automata. So I could call it formation of periodic patterns, but I want to have a link to biology. They called it morphogenetic pattern. Uh, so this work was part of PhD project by my PhD student, Mano. He hesitated to present it, so I'm doing it instead of him. Um, um, just a can question. you hear me? I can hear you. Um, do you have slides or anything to share? Can you see my slides or not? No, at, the, at least I can't see the slides. Can the others see the slides? No, uh, could you hit the share screen button, uh, please, Bucky? I, I think I, I... You should have the share screen button at, at the uh, bottom of your uh, Zoom. Yeah, uh, just a minute. I am clicking on it. Yeah, it typically takes a while until it take, carries over. Uh, Let's wait a second. But I don't see anything. Um, perhaps I you don't. Try, um, so when you click on it, you get a couple of options there. You can share a specific application. This, I don't see these options. They don't show an app. Hmm. They did in the test we did, didn't, didn't they? Sure yeah, I remember we tested it was working. I wonder if you might um, try uh, popping out and in of the of the call. Maybe closing and reopening it might do it. Yeah, it it is. It doesn't give me any option. Um, if it doesn't work, one thing that we could do is that you just a suggestion that you simply send the slides immediately to you or me, um, and we just um, present them on the screen. You just tell us when to click further. That's the, <laughs> the brute force uh, approach, but it works. <laughs> so. To send it to. How to send it? So you could email it to me. Yeah, just by email. Ah, now I see something. Oh, well, uh, it's just appeared. You see something. Ah, good. Yeah, there it is. Awesome. Uh, just a minute here. Can you see now? Yes. Yeah, awesome. Okay, good. Perfect. So this That's is exciting. about formation of patterns in cellular automata. Um, so these are two examples of periodic patterns in biology. One is uh, skin pigmentation for snake, which is more or less 
clear, doesn't need an explanation. And second, it is pre-segmentation pattern in Drosophila embryo. These are stripes and these stripes are shown by markers of certain genes in nuclei. So this is syncytium, there are many, many nucleus, but it's still one like pretty much like one cell. And different nucleus are in different stage, in different states. And these states uh, the distinguished by, by a set of genes which are expressed in each um, in each uh, nuclei. Now um, so there are many, many works on this. So I have to say something about this multi uh, multi-scale, why it comes to multi-scale in a sense. Many people model this kind of patterns, these periodic patterns using differential equations. But quite often what is observed is there are some kind of unities. Normally in biology there are cells. In this particular case, in these two particular cases, not cells. It is uh, it's kind of uh, units for snake skin, it's kind of scales of skin. And for Drosophila embryo, it is nuclei, it's not cells, they're not separated by, by membranes yet. But anyway, so these units get, or unities get very quickly to kind of one of a few stationary states. And then in a longer time scale, they change be the state because of communication with neighbors. And these kind of communications can be modeled and instead modeled in many cases by many people using cellular automata. Uh, but when I try to analyze what we, you can observe, how you can get, for example, periodic patterns in cellular automata, I didn't find any general research in, in here. Uh, so for example, the, well, it's what I will be talking about. I will be talking about elementary cellular automata. So Wolfram has published quite a few papers and he has a book, very good book, um, where he describes elementary cellular automata. But somehow this particular issue of formation periodic patterns in cellular automata is not addressed in this, neither in his papers nor in this book. And this way I decided to, that we can put this problem in a general view in a general, general way and to ask what kind of elementary cellular automata can, can reproduce formation of periodic patterns. So this periodic pattern is shown here on the bottom of the slide. It is just how it should look like. And some description of elementary cellular automata in, in this text. So each, so there is a, since elementary cellular automata, it's one dimensional chain of cellular automata. Each automata can be in one of two possible states. And this state uh, is, is affected like ch change of state of each cell can be affected by state of the cell in previous time step and state of its closest two neighbors also in previous time step. So there is lots of limitations, very, very simple case. Uh, here it is a bit more of description for cellular automata, just for completeness. So there are three cells can affect state of cell in the middle, and each cell can be in two possible states, and therefore there are eight possible uh, rules which all together combined form one elementary cellular automata. And there are four, so this um, eight symbols, each symbol can be in two possible states. So therefore it's two to the power of eight of possible elementary cellular automata of 256. Um, so Wolfram analyzed them in 80s, early 80s, and he classified them uh, like he made a classification, he split them into four classes. Homogeneous, which brings all, evolve towards all zeros or all ones, for example. Periodic, which is altering in space or in time. He found quite a lot of interesting fractal structures forming there. And complex, by complex he meant nays of previous three. So what we, what, so what we're interested, we're, we're interested in, in periodic structures, but not in time, only in space. So this should be 
periodic pattern, stationary periodic pattern. And eventually it appears that these periodic stationary periodic patterns can be belong to this uh, class two periodic structures and also to class four complex. Uh, I will show it later. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, even in terms of Wolfram, these classes to, to class to which belongs particular uh, elementary solar automata depends on initial conditions. And also he didn't consider all of them. He was, he looked closely to subclass, which is called legal solar automata and ignored many others. It's this legal, it's like around 32 or something like this. I don't remember. Um, so it, there are, so this elementary solar automata, they have some kind of internal structure. They have, well, <clears throat> each, so there, there is some kind of structure. For example, if we take one solar automata, it can have a complement solar automata. It can have a mirror solar automata and then mirror complement. And this also makes a big impact to what we will see because somehow if we see something happening to certain rule, then something very, very similar will happen to its complement to mirror and mirror complement. Therefore, we can say that all solar automata divided into groups of four. Um, so what, so again, question is what, what kind of solar automata allow formation of periodic patterns? And first very simple case is we already have, uh, we have preset two periodic pattern and what automata will not destroy it? So in course of time, nothing changes, it's already stationary. And the answer is, so there are 64 such rules, such solar automata, and in this solar automata, on, so, so each of them is represented by eight uh, binary uh, digits. So third digit should be zero and six digits should be one. Then it doesn't matter what is what are others, it will be stationary, it will stay forever. This preset to periodic pattern. Uh, if now next question would be, so we have preset, but for some reason it is destroyed. There are kind of perturbations. We can, we can apply some kind of uh, changes to, to this preset periodic pattern. So for example, with very small probability, 0 0.001 in our case, we swap state of one of cells and we look whether it can recover. And it appears that there are quite a lot of rules which allow recovery of perturbed uh, periodic pattern. So this 33 rules. In fact, so if we look closely, we find that there are two ways uh, perturbed periodic pattern can be recovered. We called one of them local, lo uh, local recovery, and second, uh, recovery by means of propagating waves. Local recovery, so here's an example of local recovery. Uh, so can you see this movie? So, so, so yes, I will run it again. Okay, so, so you see there was there are some changes from time to time in in this periodic pattern, but then it quickly recovers, basically in one time step. Sometimes in two or three time steps. So it, it is it recovers after some small changes in the system. Anyway, there are 15 elementary solar automata which allow recovery locally. And there are more, more solar automata which allow recovery a bit different way. Uh, so here a few illustrations. This is uh, for example, in panel A for rule 15, there is due to perturbation one of ones in periodic pattern changed to zero. And then we can see that this perturbation moves to the right and eventually it will disappear at the border. And same with, so if one zero changed to one also, there will be this perturbation goes to the border and disappears. Um, so, so in this case, size of this wave, it's one cell. 
uh, if we look at rule 14, panel B, so it will be, it's pretty much same story, but now there are the perturbation is a bit wider. Two cells are perturbed. Two cells are different from what they should be in periodic pattern. For, but it's again, so it's, it's moving to the border and then disappearing. For rule six, we see more complicated case. So there is a, at one hand, size of perturbation changes, alters between one and two. And if the perturbation was from one to zero, it will be one, so it, size is small. But if perturbation was from zero to one, we'll have three ones in, in same panel C, second case, blue case. Then we will see that it is much wider. This wave also goes to the, to the right, but it's much, so this perturbed area is much wider. And interesting case is on panel E, rule 30. So what happens here, here we can see that, so it's, it, there is a perturbed area, it's blue area, but front of this perturbed area moves to the right with speed like one cell per one time step, but back moves much slower, it also moves, but slower. And therefore this perturbed area is increasing in time. Uh, up to the time it gets to the, to the border, to the right border, then eventually it will shrink and disappear. Um, so here's the summary for, for for elementary cellular automata, which allow recovery of uh, preset periodic pattern by means of of propagating waves. Um, so this is next step in in this study. So now we start pretty much with random initial conditions or with any initial conditions. And we want to check, is there any cellular automata which can result to formation of stationary periodic pattern? And it, it appears that there are six elementary cellular automata which can result to formation of, of stationary periodic pattern. So, it, so there are some changes, but at the end it will be it transfers into periodic, any initial condition transfers to periodic pattern and this periodic pattern will be stationary. Uh, okay. Now, next question is, so again, in elementary cellular automata, we still can make three periodic patterns or more periodic patterns. So here on this slide, there are pictures of two different two periodic patterns. Periodic patterns like two black and white, two black and white, or other way, two whites and black, two whites and black, it's two periodic, three periodic now patterns. And if we check, so we can make same analysis as before with three periodic patterns, we find that there are 32 elementary cellular automata which keep preset three periodic pattern uh, there are four rules which allow. Uh, so it's four rules which allow formation of so which keeps both periodic patterns: two blacks and white, and white black, two whites and and black, or two blacks and white. So it's four can keep either of these two three periodic patterns. And if we analyze, if we perturb and see who can recover, whether these three periodic patterns can recover, we found out that there are uh, two uh, elementary cellular automata which allow recovery of three periodic patterns. One of them allows recovery of two black and one white periodic, first type of three periodic pattern and rule 94 of second type of three periodic pattern. Um, Next question would be to look at four and more periodic patterns. Four periodic patterns, there are three types of four periodic patterns. It is zero, three ones, two zeros, two ones, or three zeros, one one. And it's again, so if we check what can, what rules can keep a preset periodic patterns, uh, there are, three, well, there are three, for each of these three classes we have if I don't remember, 16 rules for each, yeah. And there is one rule which is in common, which is identity 
solar automata, which doesn't change anything. Uh, but what is interesting, if we perturb for periodic pattern, it can't be recovered with any elementary solar automata. And evidently, no four periodic patterns can form from random initial conditions with any of elementary solar automata. And this result is also true for three periodic. Three periodic, uh, uh, three periodic patterns, it was here. No rules allow the formation of three periodic patterns from random initial conditions. That same is four periodic and five periodic. Now, how it is related to biology? Okay, just a reminder, there are three minutes left only. So would you please soon come to an end with your talk? Yeah, just it is pretty much end of the talk, Thanks. yeah. Um, <clears throat> again, so if we want, it's again, so with, up to now we considered elementary solar automata, two states each cell affected by two closest neighbors and states of two closest neighbors and this cell itself. So if we want to have more periodicity, more than two periodicity, and for example, if we want to get uh, formation of three or four periodic patterns in cellular automata, we should consider more complicated cellular automata. For example, we should either allow more states for each cell or allow longer range interactions. And in this, for biological implementation, it, it could be like this. Each, for example, if one single cell can, state of cell is defined by expression of one gene, then this would be this elementary cellular automata we were considering now. If there are two cells which affect state of the cell, then th th this could be considered as four state automata, then state of each cell is represent, is can be described by, well, can be described, can, be, can have, each cell can have four different states. But just same analysis which we did for elementary cellular automata is not working here because here number of cases, number of cellular automata is so big that it needs to, to somehow reduction. We need somehow to reduce it. And one way to reduce it, it's indeed to get back to biology and to consider, for example, two genes which are responsible for, for state, for shaping the state of cells. Um, and here's conclusions for what I presented. So I can say a very simple case when I used on, only elementary cellular automata. Uh, so for this, we, we made a more or less complete analysis when it, we identified groups of elementary cellular automata allowing local and global recovery of disturbed preset to periodic patterns. We identified elementary cellular automata low information of two periodic patterns from any initial conditions. We, we also made similar analysis for three periodic patterns and found that at least there are two um, elementary cellular automata which allow local recovery of preset two periodic patterns. And with four periodic patterns, it's pretty much hopeless because they are not stable and they can't form from random initial conditions. So, in, so this is, well, it's pretty much all what I wanted to present. Uh, so this, I think it's first step in analysis of pattern formation, pattern formation in, in cellular automata. This we did with elementary cellular automata be somehow extended to more complicated. Okay. Right. So thanks a lot for this presentation. So is there any short question? from the audience. If this is not the case, I would have a, a question where I would just hope that there's a short answer. So if there's a short answer, <laughs> um, it's good. Otherwise we should postpone, I think. Um, so on slide 12, um, we had seen one recovery case where um, you basically saw this, this pattern that was jumping basically from left to the right and after a while it recovered, which was basically, I think this propagating wave that you referred to. So can you say something about how this scales in terms of number of times steps that you need to recover um, when your domain increases? So if your domain size increases, uh, okay. so like a short answer to that? Well, this now it will depend. Uh, so it is true, so it's a very interesting question. If dom So in our case, the domain size was fixed. If domain size is, is increasing, then in key, for case of 
local recovery. Probably it depends how what kind of rules we apply for the border, which is increasing. Okay. But with in case of propagating waves, then it should be another question where the increase of domain is faster than speed of propagating wave or slower. If it will be faster, then then it will never recover. So it will be always disturbed one side. I see, I see, yeah. Well, probably this could be kind of answer to this. But we didn't look. So we always were looking at domain of fixed size with yep. fixed boundary conditions. So this, it's again, see, it's yeah. different from what did Wolfram in his Okay, books. great. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, thanks a lot for that. Um, so um, we'll now just jump to the next um, talk, which is uh, once again a recording, as far as I know. Um, given by Roderick Melnick, and which is on microtubule biomechanics and the effect of degradation of elastic moduli. Looking forward to that one. Good morning to all the listeners. Today, I, Sandeep Singh, a postdoc researcher at MS2 Discovery Interdisciplinary Research Institute at Wilfrid Laurier University, is going to present our paper titled Microtubule Biomechanics and the Effect of Degradation of Elastic Moduli. So this is an overview of my presentation. I will start with introduction to microtubule, then discuss in brief about different types of electromechanical coupling, elaborate the developed computational model for capturing the electromechanical response of microtubules, then discuss some of the key findings obtained from the developed model, and at last conclude my presentation. Microtubule is one of the most fundamental structural elements found in the cytoskeleton of the biological cell that helps them to withstand both static as well as dynamic loading. So microtubules are the stiffest protein polymer in the cytoskeleton that comprises of heterodimers of alpha and beta tubuli that stack end to end to form a linear protofilament and then associate laterally to form a single microtubule that is represented as a long cylindrical object. So typically a microtubule is composed of 13 protofilaments, but those with 8 to 16 protofilaments have also been reported. The length of the microtubule varies from 1 micrometer to 50 micrometers and again is dependent on the polymerization and depolymerization of these dimers. So this is a schematic description of single microtubule with 13 protofilament. So as you can see, the reddish or brownish one represents the alpha dimer and bluish one represents the beta dimer. So these dimers are stacked head to tail so as to form a single protofilament. So this stack, stacking of alpha and beta dimers in alternative form represents one protofilament. And the combination of these protofilaments in lateral direction, say this is first protofilament, this is second, this is third, and this is fourth, fifth, and the combination of this in lateral direction give rise to a single microtubule structure. Electromechanical coupling is a phenomena whereby an electric charge is developed when mechanical force is applied to a material or a mechanical strain is developed under the application of electric field. Probably the most well-known example of this coupling is piezoelectricity that was discovered way back in 1880s by the Curie brothers. Later, in 1950s, piezoelectric property was experimentally demonstrated in wood and bone. Importantly, electromechanical coupling properties of biomaterial are of great interest for applications in biocompatible sensors and actuators along with eco-friendly energy harvesters. Further, the electromechanical coupling processes can be classified based on intrinsic as well as extrinsic material responses. The intrinsic processes are electromechanical coupling responses that are related to the crystal symmetry and molecular structure of the material. So they include piezoelectricity, electrostriction and flexoelectricity. While the extrinsic processes usually originate from external factors not directly related to the molecular structure, such as electrochemical migration of injected charges or mobile ions and elastic deformation due to externally applied or produced electrostatic forces. Since in this work we are focusing only on the intrinsic processes that are directly related to molecular structure of the material, so I will discuss some of these intrinsic electromechanical phenomena in brief. So first one is the piezoelectricity. 
Piezo electricity is basically the two way linear electromechanical coupling between the electric field and mechanical strain. The conversion of mechanical deformation in it into electric field is referred to as direct piezoelectric effect and the conversion of applied electric field into mechanical strain is referred to as converse effect. So this figure graphically explains the basic mechanism of direct and converse electro piezoelectric effects. Piezoelectricity requires lack of inversion symmetry, in other words, non-centrosymmetric arrangement of dipole moments within a material. In this figure, the red arrows represents dipole direction of non-centrosymmetric domains and the blue arrow represents the applied mechanical stress. So the piezoelectric response of material will be maximum when all domains in a material are aligned in the same direction. So in this figure, this part represents the direct effect whereby the direct application of mechanical stress results in applied electric field and this part represents the converse effect whereby the, the, like, the application of applied electric field results in mechanical deformation. So the next intrinsic electromechanical phenomena is electrostriction that is present in all di dielectric materials where deformation occur under the application of electric field. But unlike piezoelectricity, the electrostriction does not require an alignment of permanent dipole across all domains. Thus, in theory, all polarizable material can exhibit an electrostriction behavior. Also, in contrast to piezoelectricity, whereby linear electromechanical coupling is there, electrostriction has non-linear quadratic relationship between mechanical strain and electric field. Another intrinsic electromechanical phenomena is flexoelectricity that originates from the polarization induced by a strain gradient. So basically, if a dielectric material is deformed in a non-uniform manner, such as through bending, a strain or stress gradient is generated in the material. So this induced gradient can break the inversion symmetry by resulting in a non-uniform displacement of atom. The electromechanical coupling between the strain, strain gradient and the electric field can be mathematically expressed utilizing a thermodynamic based constitutive framework using Gibbs free energy function that is given by this particular expression where G is the Gibbs free energy function, S denotes the entropy, T is temperature, epsilon is strain, uh, sigma is stress, P is polarization and E is electric field. Further, uh, this particular figure represents the relationship between mechanical variables and electrical variables in the uh, intrinsic uh, electromechanical coupling such as piezoelectric, electrostriction as well as flexoelectric. In this study, a three-dimensional coupled electromechanical model of a microtubule has been developed uh, including the piezoelectric effect. So basically the microtubule comprising of 13 protofilaments have been modeled as a single hollow cylinder having inner and outer diameters of 15 nanometers and 23 nanometers respectively. So the total length of microtubule have been considered to be 320 nanometers. So a trapezoidal uh, load function with a loading period of one second as shown in this particular figure has been used to apply the compressive force at the top surface of the microtubule with fixed and grounded bottom. So this applied force is similar to the commonly used loading unloading path that is used in nano indentation experiments for evaluating cell biomechanics. The mechanical, piezoelectric and dielectric properties of microtubule considered in the present study have been uh, presented in this particular table. Uh, importantly, the piezoelectric coefficients considered in this study uh, for microtubule have been assumed similar to that of experimentally quantified values of collagen. So our main aim is to quantify the effect of degradation of microtubule associated uh, with aging or pathological disease on the electroelastic response of the developed coupled electromechanical model. So when uh, subjected to external applied forces. In this study, the microtubule degradation is simulated by altering the mechanical properties of the microtubule, keeping the structural feature intact. The governing equation for the linearly coupled electromechanical model of microtubule is given by this particular expression that uh, couples the stress, strain and electric field and the strain field is related to displacement field uh, by this particular expression 
and electric field uh, can be presented as a negative gradient of electric potential that is given by this expression and all these above presented uh, constitutive equation are further subjected to equilibrium condition and gauss law with the assumption of vanishing body forces and vanishing free charge the developed coupled electromechanical models fidelity and integrity have been evaluated by comparing the predicted results of the current model with that of previously reported study of how it does so the geometrical details of the zinc oxide nanowire with hexagonal cross section that have been considered for the numerical validation have been completely adopted from howitzel and have been presented in figure a so figure uh, b presents the piezoelectric potential computed from a uh, coupled electromechanical model reported by howitzel under the application of 100 nanonewton compressive force along the z axis at the top surface and the fixed bottom of the nanowire so the piezoelectric potential in volts obtained uh, under the 100 nanonewton compressive force from our current model have been presented in figure c so as it is clearly evident uh, that the piezoelectric potential distribution obtained from the present study completely matches with that obtained by howitzel with a maximum absolute potential of 0.48 volts further the maximum displacement uh, in nanometer induced at the top surface of the nanowire under the application of 100 nanonewton compressive force from our present model uh, has been found to be 0.03 nanometer nanometer that is consistent with that obtained with uh, the previous study of howitzel moreover the different model have also been validated with the applied compressive force of 85 uh, nanonewton at the top surface Apologies, the sound is struggling a bit. I'm just going to open the video in a different player and hope for an improvement there. Just be one minute. All right, let's try again. Previous study of Howitzel. Moreover, the developed model have also been validated with the applied compressive force of 85 uh, nanonewton at the top surface, and again, a good agreement have been found between our model prediction and the result reported by previous study of Howitzel. So thus, our developed model is consistent with the previous works and lends great confidence in the results derived from the developed coupled electromechanical model. The total displacement distribution at the end of one second uh, of the loading period, that basically represents the uh, maximum loading condition, uh, have been presented for undegraded, 50% degraded, and 90% degraded micro tubule in this part. The electric potential distribution predicted. Uh, from the electromechanical model of microtubule under the application of dynamic load has been presented in this figure uh, for undegraded 50% degraded and 90% degraded microtubule again the maximum absolute value of electric potential uh, has been obtained for the highly degraded uh, microtubule which can be attributed to a higher magnitude of displacement induced for the microtubule with 90% degraded elastic modulus the force displacement curve for the uh, undegraded 50% degraded and 90% degraded microtubules uh, has been presented in this particular figure so as evident from this figure that there prevail noticeable differences in the three curves uh, with the slope of force displacement curve on higher side for undegraded microtubule and decreases with an increase in the percentage of degradation the electroelastic response of 1 micrometer long microtubule subjected to a compressive force of 0.1 nanonewton at the top surface has been presented in this figure the electroelastic response of 1 micrometer long microtubule subjected to a shear force of 0.1 nanonewton at the top surface has been presented in this figure so as can be seen the application of shear force has a far more pronounced effect on the electroelastic response of microtubule as compared to the compressive force of the same magnitude that was presented in earlier slide 
In this study, we have also evaluated the effect of length of microtubule on the ele electroelastic response under the application of external forces. So although uh, the microtubule can be up to 50 micrometer long, the typical length of microtubule ranges between 0.5 to 10 micrometer. So we have considered three effective lengths of the microtubule that is 1 micrometer, 5 micrometer and 10 micrometer in this analysis. So it can be seen from the figure that both the total displacement and electric uh, potential increases linearly with the increase of externally applied compressive force. The effect of microtubule length on the applied shear force has been uh, presented in this particular figure. Again, the trends are similar to uh, those presented in earlier figure for compressive forces, uh, but the magnitude are uh, significantly higher as compared to the previous slides. In this work, a finite element based three dimensional coupled electromechanical model of microtubule have been developed for accurately quantifying its complex mechanics at a cellular scale under the influence of external uh, stimuli. So a comparative analysis has been conducted for evaluating the effect of degradation of elastic moduli uh, of microtubule on their electroelastic response under the application of dynamic loading. So it has been found that 90% degraded microtubule results in uh, one order of magnitude higher displacements and uh, around 35% higher electric potential generation as compared to the undegraded microtubule. It has been further observed that the application of shear force leads to both higher displacement and higher electric field generation as compared to application of compressive force. Moreover, the increase in the length of microtubule results in significant rise in the predicted electric potential under the application of external forces. So we expect a, for a future extension of the proposed model for biomedical engineering and other related applications ranging from sensing to energy harvesting devices based on biological systems. These are the acknowledgements. Thank you very much for listening. So thank you, uh, Roderick, for this uh, presentation. Um, I don't see any questions from the audience. Maybe there's some more questions popping up soon. In the meanwhile, I would have one question to you. So how about computational cost of your uh, simulations? So how long did a typical simulation in your case run and which compute resources did you require for that? Um, Philip, uh, thanks for the question. This is actually Roderick. Uh, the talk was given by, by my postdoc in my lab, uh, Dr. Singh. I see, sorry uh, for that. Uh, sorry about this. Um, so uh, yeah, um, this is in fact uh, uh, sort of as conference presentation, it's a part of a bigger project. And a bigger project is uh, biological cells and coupled electromechanical effects, um, which was a new model, uh, which would include microtubules, cellular organelles, and non-local contributions. And that's the reason why we are talking here about not only piezoelectric effects, uh, but also flex electricity and, and other electromechanical effects. Now, in terms of computational cost, these bigger projects uh, require several hours uh, to run uh, on our supercomputer facility in Canada, Sharknet. Whereas this sub-project where the idea was only to demonstrate the importance of taking into account uh, this effect of uh, degradation of elastic modulus, um, it's it's uh, not big computational time. We are talking about basically uh, on the order uh, up to 20 minutes. I see. All right. Thanks. Thank you. So I don't see any other open questions here. Um, and it's time to move on anyway. So I would just say um, thanks again um, to your postdoc for the recording and to you for uh, joining the Q&A session. Uh, Roderick, um, and then I would say we'll jump into the um, last presentation for today and for this workshop, um, which will be given by uh, John Turner on coupled microstructure result simulation of metal additive manufacturing processes. Um, you, do you have the recording available? Uh, John, you're presenting live, is that right? Are you ah, able to all right. Hit, hit the share button. Perfect. John, I, let me just unmute you, sorry.
Can I do that? You might need to unmute yourself. Oh, sorry. Please try again. Okay, can you hear me? <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, sorry about that. Let's see. My slides don't seem to be moving. Hang on. Oh, yep, I can see them going. Okay. Okay, thank you very much for uh, in including me. Um, good morning, good afternoon, wherever, whatever it happens to be where you are. Um, so I'm going to talk about this uh, project. Uh, it's called XAM. Uh, we're doing simulation of metal additive manufacturing, um, uh, very high fidelity, as part of the, ex the US uh, DOE Department of Energy Exascale Computing Project. Um, our partners, uh, so I'm at, the, at Oak Ridge National Laboratory, and my partners, uh, partner laboratories are Lawrence Livermore, Los Alamos, and also the, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, uh, NIST. Um, so um, metal additive manufacturing is, uh, is a process where you, whereby you take uh, uh, powders um, and, and hit them with a, a, a laser or an electron beam uh, and, and melt them and build them up into layers uh, into, a, into full size parts. Um, it's really uh, uh, exploded over the last few years, um, and the attraction is that you can make very complex parts that you can't make with uh, traditional techniques. Uh, you can design the materials, uh, and, and we have a lot of control over process variables. There are some challenges. You get some very unfamiliar microstructures, and if you're not careful, they can have very poor properties. Um, and uh, I'll say more about the uh, process structure property performance relationship and how that plays into the simulation aspects. Um, uh, one of the, uh, uh, the attractions is that there is an enormous parameter space where you can operate, uh, optimize the process uh, parameters. Um, to the right, you see uh, a couple of movies. Um, you see um, a pile of powder in the upper right, and then uh, in the middle, uh, this is from a publication a couple of years ago uh, uh, showing the um, a laser hitting the powder and you see lots of movements, spatter, uh, and you see the melted uh, and solidified uh, dark region uh, after the lasers pass by. So there's a lot going on, a lot of coupled uh, complex uh, uh, physics. Um, so we're developing a suite of capabilities to uh, incorporate the microstructure evolution into the AM process simulation uh, to enable us to understand the how the um, how how you, how you, we can uh, obtain location specific properties, um, which is really essential for uh, uh, performance uh, part performance certification. Um, so, if you're not familiar, Oak Ridge National Laboratory is in Tennessee. Uh, it's one of the 17 uh, uh, U.S. Department of Energy uh, national laboratories, and you see I've highlighted our our partners uh, Los Alamos and Lawrence Livermore. Los Alamos is in New Mexico, uh, just to the west of Texas, and Lawrence Livermore is out in California. Um, NIST is not shown on here, but they are outside of Washington, D.C., um, just to give you a, a perspective of, of, of where we're located. Um, the national laboratories have a tradition of fielding very large uh, computer systems, and they, are, they continue to get uh, larger and more powerful, just like uh, some of the um, uh, large computing centers in, in Europe. Uh, uh, our, our previous machine was called Titan, and it was, uh, it was retired a couple of, uh, just a, a year or two ago. Um, it was a Cray with one, uh, with 19,000 uh, nodes. Each one had a, a 16 core AMD and, and a Kepler K20X uh, uh, GPU. It was replaced uh, in, in, uh, in mid-2018 uh, uh, by our current machine, which is called Summit. Um, in some ways, a very different machine. In some ways, very similar. It's got a different CPU, but uh, uh, it's also got NVIDIA GPUs. Uh, this time, uh, uh, six Voltas um, V100s for each two uh, CPU uh, uh, 
for each two 22 core IBM uh, CPUs. So the node count is much smaller in, in Summit, only 4,600 nodes rather than 19,000, but each node is in, extremely uh, powerful, 42 teraflops. Um, uh, uh, so quite a bit more powerful than the Titan nodes. Um, and you can see that we, the, the, although power has, uh, the performance has gone up um, almost a factor of 10, the, uh, the power consumption has gone only from uh, nine megawatts to 13 megawatts. Our next machine uh, was announced, has been announced and it uh, is called Frontier. Um, and it will, we will return to Cray as the uh, integrator. Uh, it will be another uh, shift, this time shifting both CPUs and GPUs um, to both, uh, both being based on AMD processors. Um, um, the, one of the reasons I point this out is that the, although we want to take maximum advantage of, of these, uh, these architectures and the, the hardware, we, we need to be able to uh, um, develop our software in a, in a way that is, uh, is agnostic to the underlying hardware. Uh, because uh, we do see so much um, change underneath. So we need to be able to program not just with, uh, for example, something like CUDA, which, which runs on uh, NVIDIA, uh, but something more agnostic that, uh, that will run on both NVIDIA and AMD hardware. So <clears throat> these machines are getting increasingly you know, challenging to program uh, because of the, the uh, layers of memory hierarchy and uh, different, different architectures. And most especially the, uh, the increasing cost of uh, moving data relative to computation. So we, have, we see an intense need to, to have algorithms that emphasize locality, uh, higher order methods, particle-based methods, um, and also a shift to recomputing uh, uh, values that we need rather than accessing stored data. So we have a much higher cost of global synchronization, um, so a lot of our codes are moving to uh, asynchronous models of, uh, of, um, of, of computing. So that's kind of underlying all of this uh, um, uh, application development. <clears throat> um, there are a number of programming models that are being developed um, to help with this uh, uh, hardware um, agnostic um, aspect that I mentioned. For on-node uh, parallelism, there are things like Cocos and Raja, OpenACC, OpenCL, um, <clears throat> things like that. Between the nodes, there are things like Legion, uh, uh, UPC++, and Global Arrays. That's in addition to the, the, the very common M MPI, um, raw MPI approaches. And we're, we're taking advantage of all of those things. <clears throat> okay, so, this project is part of uh, an overall exascale computing project. There's an exascale project in Europe as well. I won't dwell on this. It's just uh, to show that this is one piece of a larger, uh, larger program. And even within the program, there are a number of applications being developed. This is one of them uh, on uh, metal, metal parts. There are many other applications being developed for nuclear energy, um, <clears throat> um, uh, subsurface flow, climate modeling, combustion, things like that. So this is one one application project. So returning to additive manufacturing, it was a it's a it was really invented back in the 80s. Initially uh, intended for rapid prototyping and and freeform fabrication. In recent years, it's become uh, and and you you saw it initially with uh, polymers, <clears throat> but 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 the uh, uh, the ability to to uh, additively manufacture or 3D print metals has really exploded over the last couple of years. So it's really a family of manufacturing processes that involves building up parts bit by bit, or um, uh, you know, and it can be anything from polymers, carbon inf uh, infused uh, polymers to uh, metals of different types, uh, inconels, stainless steel, titanium, and we're going to focus on that. <clears throat> It's a very, additive manufacturing is very uh, attractive because you get, you can make very complex things with fewer parts, you get less waste, you can repair things like turbine blades, and you can also replicate. You can take a, an object that you, you have, scan it, build a, a mesh for it, and then uh, make a new, a new one. So lots of, lots of advantages. 
You notice that I did not mention speed. Uh, this is typically, additive manufacturing is typically not a fast uh, uh, process. Where you win with additive is through the complexity and, and doing things that you were unable to do before. Okay, so, so the underlying physics of metal AM is very similar to welding. There's, uh, you start with a feedstock, uh, there's energy deposition, there's uh, melting and solidification, evaporation, condensation, heat and mass transfer, solid solid phase transformation for some alloys, and this re repeated he heating and cooling. Um, so you can start with a wire, you can hit it with a, a laser or an E-beam, uh, or you can start with a powder. We're focusing in this project on the powder bed technologies where you take a, um, you know, a powder that is say some tens of nanometers uh, uh, in size and, and uh, hit it with an electron, a, a laser, which is, you'd see in the middle, uh, or an electron beam, which is in the lower right corner. Um, and that melts the powder and it fuses and you do this layer by layer and build up a, 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 full, a full size part. And these are typically- uh, Four more minutes. Sorry? Oh, there's four more minutes. Yes, thank you. Okay, so I better speed up. Okay, the challenge is that um, in traditional uh, manufacturing processes, you can, it's, it's, it's fairly well understood how to get nice microstructures in additive. You can get very nasty microstructures like you see here, these needle, um, uh, uh, microstructures. Um, however, we have a lot of control over uh, the processing parameters which lead us to uh, be able to control that microstructure. The, the process leads to that microstructure which has a direct correlation with the properties and ultimately the, the performance. So you hear uh, often this discussion of process structure properties performance and that's really essential to qualification. We have a validation, um, we're working with NIST on validation. So we have test problems where we can build under very controlled uh, um, uh, situations, build parts and then measure them. Uh, this is a in situ thermography of the scan path leading to the part on the right, which we're using as a test bed. And we can measure the strain and the displacement, the deflection after a part is built. Um, and that leads to this, uh, this is a EBSD um, uh, version of uh, view of the microstructure where the colors represent um, uh, grain orientations. And this is what we're trying, we're uh, uh, simulating in the XAM project. Um, overall, the process involves uh, a, a, a very coupled um, uh, environment between the melt pool, what's happening at the melt pool scale, driving microstructure, leading to um, uh, collections of grains which behave in a certain way leading to properties, uh, micromechanical properties. And then we upscale, that needs to be upscaled back to a, um, the full part build. So we've uh, 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 divided this into, into a multi-stage process where really the as-built microstructure is the most coupled uh, aspect of the, of the part, uh, of the build process. And you can see the um, it's coupled coupling between the thermomechanics uh, CFD happening within the melt pool and then the evolution of the grain structure. <clears throat> Sometimes you have a late time microstructure that can happen either during the build or after the build where uh, we have solid solid phase uh, transformations, but that can be a decoupled uh, part of the part of the simulation. Um, we have a collection of codes. Um, most of which we are re releasing as open source. They use a, 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 there's no single code that has all the, all the physics we need. So we've, we're developing a suite of codes that work together to solve the problem. Um, what, if I provide the slides, I'll, I'll, I'll provide links to the, uh, um, to the software um, to make it, a, make it available. Not all of it has been released open source yet. Um, so we're still working on that, but all, uh, most of it is intended to be eventually open source. Hi, John, one more minute. Okay, um, so I'm gonna go quickly through the uh, build process. So we start with a coarse build uh, using assumed properties, uh, follow that with a, a detailed um, build coupled simulation of the melt pool and, and thermomechanics to, to uh, evolve a, a grain structure. We feed that to, um, I'm going to skip this on the parallel in time approach for the uh, uh, melt pool. We feed that to the, um, uh, 
to a, a cellular automata model, which uh, builds the, um, uh, really creates the, the grain structure that we work with. And that's really a, one of the key parts is, is getting that microstructure that we need to feed to the to a polycrystal plasticity um, uh, simulation <clears throat> to, uh, to determine uh, uh, the micromechanical properties. One of the things I want to point out is that uh, if, you, if you look at that microstructure shown on this slide, it's very complex and it's very it's difficult to um, determine what an appropriate uh, representative volume element uh, for a structure like this would be. Um, so we're doing some studies to, to determine that. Um, we, we need that to get the, uh, uh, the, the plastic strain uh, to, to represent the micromechanical properties. Um, so finally, we upscale those properties um, to get a yield, a yield surface um, and a property surface, feed that back into our full part build, uh, and then re rerun the full build simulation to get a more accurate representation of the, of the, uh, the residual stress and deflection and, and uh, inherent properties of the final part. Um, so uh, a high fidelity uh, environment like the one that we're building can be used, uh, we're, as I said, we're making it available to the community. Uh, the, the APIs between the different stages. Um, it's useful for performing virtual experiments. There lots of uh, open questions about the significance of fluid flow and, and relative significance of different phenomena. It enables us to explore surface tension models and uh, effects like inoculants that can be added to, uh, to, to more control the, uh, the solidification. And maybe most importantly, to serve as reference simulations or uh, provide synthetic data for training neural networks. So we view this as a, a sort of direct numerical sim simulation of, of additive manufacturing. So we can uh, generate data that we'll make available to the community uh, from which we can develop and uh, uh, c calibrate reduced order models that, uh, that can run much faster and won't require uh, supercomputers and also test and quanti quantify the validity of approximations and assumptions in the reduced order models. So I'll stop there and, and take questions. So thanks a lot, John, for this very interesting talk and also once again pointing to us out actually where uh, supercomputing is heading um, these days. Um, so are there any questions from the audience? Um, I definitely have one and I would just stay to the, basically the last slide, not the very last slide, but the slide before that, uh, where you just mentioned neural networks and reduced order models at the end. So at which stages do you plan uh, to bring in the neural networks? Because I mean, if you look at the various stages, there are, I think many points where you could think of um, plugging this, this methodology in, but where do you see it? specifically the, the, the target uh, points yeah, there. Yeah, so, so there are a couple of places. One, one is that I, I, I glossed over, I know very, very quickly, but one key thing is we can't afford, even with the supercomputers, we can't afford to run uh, the, the, um, the, the fine scale um, uh, uh, grain growth models and, and some, some of the even lower uh, subgrain uh, phase field models, we can't afford to run them everywhere. So one, one possibility, and also the crystal plasticity, the micromechanical, um, we're going, going to need to sample throughout the part. And, and so one, one possible um, uh, uh, use of, the, of, of machine learning is, is to help us to know the, the optimal uh, uh, places to sample for those uh, micromechanical, uh, um, the polycrystal plasticity um, uh, uh, simulations, um, but then on the at, at, for for the reduced order models, that's really the um, um, for, for the those that thermal um, stage, uh, the stage one where we're doing the melt pool and and growing the grains. That's a very expensive part because that's mm -hmm. that's the coupled part. So if we can if we can uh, parameterize some aspects of of that so that we re we really want to connect the the process parameters like the the beam speed, the scan strategy, the beam power, there's a ton of these, these parts. How, see, yeah. how do they lead to a, a, the final uh, properties of the product? And so if we can come up with, uh, use, use machine learning to come up with um, correlations or reduced order models to get, to connect those process parameters to the properties, 
um, that's that's probably the that's probably what is mo of most interest to the people operating additive machines or uh, to industry or um, mm -hmm. I see. Uh, so really those two two aspects. Mm -hmm. I see. Thanks a lot. Um, there's one question by from David Costa. He's asking how many people are involved in this effort. I think he means XIAM. Um, and how many node hours per year are you using in this project? So um, a lot of the a lot of the time today. So so they're probably um, roughly uh, twenty or thirty people across the different institutions uh, working on different pieces of the uh, of the project. Um, we haven't actually burned a lot of computer time so far. It, we've done a lot of development, but just to get the the codes and the models in place, our use has ramped up quite a bit over the over the last little bit, and so we're running on Summit, and 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 using you know somewhere on the order of you know ten thousand or so node hours uh, you know per quarter or something like that, and that's probably going to increase as we uh, go farther in the project and do larger problems. But a lot of the time to, to this point has been developing the codes. Great. Uh, thank you very much for, for, for this answer. Um, so I don't see any additional questions from the audience. So thanks a lot once again for this um, very interesting um, forward looking talk on on Exascale and the one of the applications for that. Um, with that, um, we come to the end of this workshop and I would like to hand back um, to the organizers uh, once again saying thank you to all of you guys for presenting in the session and also thanking the organizers for putting everything here together. With this, um, handing back to, I guess, Peter Coppany, right? Yeah, that's right. Thank you very much, Trip. I don't want to detain people unnecessarily at the end of two days, but I do want to make a few comments. Um, and my own thoughts are that this has been a, a tremendously interesting conference with a demonstration of an immense amount of quality and breadth, as is fitting for this subject of computational science, which kind of brings disciplines together because methodologies and algorithms turn out to be extremely commonly applicable, regardless of the domain of interest. Many of the domains are looking at pressing matters of considerable importance, uh, socially, health-wise, economically, uh, environmentally, really big problems that have to be addressed and um, assessed in a, in a quantitative way. The methods that we've been talking about, very pertinent there. So um, I'd like to just let everyone know that in statistical terms, the meeting has been pretty sizable, far bigger than we'd expected it to be. Um, we had 266 registered people. Uh, the peak on any of the sessions re reached about 100 at one moment. And we think we've had over 200 views on the um, streaming YouTube, possibly getting towards 300. The details of that will only become clear uh, as we uh, sort of digest the numbers down the line. So just to let everyone know, we'll have uh, video recordings going up soon on YouTube. We better notify everyone about that. I want to mention um, at this moment once more the Vecna toolkit, which was uh, an item of focus during the meeting, particularly this morning. Do take a look at that, uh, a major annual release of uh, that, that software, which is open source and, and open development. And since people from inside the Vecna project have been behind running this project, I do want to emphasize that we're very much uh, in the business of welcoming uh, collaborations with other people, anyone who wants to talk to us about uh, instrumenting codes with these techniques, uh, I'd strongly encourage them to approach us, and us means potentially me, Derek Crone, or a number of the other organizers that I will mention shortly. Um, as befits a uh, modern organization of meetings, we will be sending all registered uh, attendees a questionnaire just to get a, 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 their opinions uh, and views on how they felt the online conference experience went. Uh, with such a, a large number of people showing their interest here, it, it immediately makes one think 
that this might be worth considering in the future. And that's the sort of thing I'd be interested in trying to get people's views on whether uh, in future forever it would be online is another, uh, another issue, but it's certainly worth taking a poll now of those uh, views. I think this is the point where I can begin to close the meeting and in doing that I really have to thank a lot of people who've put the meeting together. From the moment we realised the pandemic was engulfing us, there were a number of people who realised we had to try to rescue what had happened to uh, significant individual events like the SIAM meeting, UQ and the ICCS events. And uh, it's been, uh, you know, a tribute to their indefatigable efforts that we're, we've been able to put this meeting on, as well as, of course, the interest from the wider uh, community. But I think I should name the people who've pulled their weight here and acknowledge them. So um, I'm just going to mention their names, that, that they include Diana Suleimaneva, uh, Apostolos Evangelopoulos, Anna Nikishova, Shwanye Go, Bartosz Bosak, Olivier Honan, Walter Edeling, and, and Derek Krohn. And one of the people who's been sort of ubiquitous, audibly, if not visibly, but sort of almost everywhere, uh, on just everywhere trying to keep the meeting together is, is Hugh Martin. So I'd like uh, to, to thank them, and I'm sure I'm speaking on behalf of everyone who has participated in the meeting to thank them, although this is a sort of silent style of acknowledgement. With that, I think I'm able to um, close the meeting by thanking everyone very much for their participation, and I hope you will remain in contact with us and enjoy a pleasant weekend. Thank you very much indeed.